You're listening to the Walled Garden Podcast. This podcast is a part of the Walled Garden Online Community, a community dedicated to sharing and discussing philosophy, beliefs, ideas, and creativity among all types of people in order to gain new insight on some of life's biggest questions and make the most of how we live. We appreciate you joining us. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Walled Garden Podcast. So today I have for you another conversation with one of my favorite people in the entire world, Professor Joseph Siracusa. And uh, one of the big topics of discussion going around the world at the moment uh, is the prospect of a war with China. This is obviously something that's in the news headlines. There's a lot of sensationalism around it. Uh, What I wanted to do today with Professor Joseph Siracusa is really have a conversation about his perspective on this, because many of you will know that he's an expert on international diplomacy. You know, he's, uh, he's got a vast experience with uh, with these sorts of questions around war, uh, po- politics, diplomacy, uh, and including nuclear weapons. He's a world-renowned expert on nuclear weapons and nuclear history. And so he's just the kind of person who we want to talk to to get a better perspective, uh, you know, apart from all of the sensationalism that goes on in the media. You know, what does somebody like Joseph Siracusa think about the prospect of a war with China? And so this is a really fascinating conversation, and I, I really just open it up to Joe, uh, as I do usually, just to, to, you know, let him tell us what he, think is, he thinks is necessary necessary for us to know with this uh, particular situation. So, if you've been interested lately um, in, uh, in, in what, you know, the kind of political dynamics between China and America and Australia and I guess the rest of the world as well, uh, then this is going to be an episode that gives you a lot to think about. Joseph really, uh, you know, he, he, he really packs on the, the wisdom and the information that he's learned over his uh, life and, um, and gives us a different perspective. So, the only thing that I want to mention before we jump into the episode is if you haven't already done so, go and check out thewalledgarden.com. Uh, that's my new collaboration, obviously, with this podcast and with Sharon LaBelle, Kai Whiting, and Jacob Bush. And we've got some great stuff going on over there. And if you'd like to join the community, then we'd love to see you there. And you can use the promo code Practical Stoic if you're becoming a caretaker member. And I'll let you see what benefits you get when you go over to the website. Uh, but if you use that promo code Practical Stoic, all one word, all uppercase, then you can get a discount for that membership. And uh, that's only for the first hundred members. So we'd love to see you over there. And there's one more way that I'm going to invite you to get involved because uh, until December, we're doing meetups every week with Sharon. Kai, Jake, and myself, and and other members of the community, and also uh, just people who want to come along and contribute and and hear what we're up to. And uh, these are basically meetups where we're discussing our vision for the World Garden. And so we are having philosophical discussions. We're having theological discussions. We're really trying to figure out exactly which direction we want to take this. And because of that, it's absolutely vital that we invite you guys along to give your perspective and to uh, really guide us and to tell us where you think it would be interesting for us to take our thinking or to uh, to take the direction of the Walled Garden podcast and the Walled Garden community. So come along to those meetups. You can go to thewalledgarden.com forward slash events and you can see all of the meetups listed there and you can register for those and attend. So anyway, without any further ado, I want to present to you my conversation with Professor Joseph Siracusa. Joe, it's uh, obviously great to have you uh, again. And um, I I guess I'm not going to do much of an introduction here other than to say that, you know, obviously the topic that you want to cover today, um, and I'm being guided by where you think we should go in many ways. And so... Um, you've you've told me that you want to kind of cover this China America Australia relationship, um, and I guess obviously we're living in a time where these relationships are coming into question. Um, and it seems to me when I go and I you know I kind of look online, I see what people are saying. There are a lot of people who would convince you that, uh, or try to convince you that uh, the relations aren't that strong, and that there's potential of a war coming up, and all sorts of things. And so. I've kind of fallen into that rabbit hole many times where I have tended to think that uh, maybe the possibility of some kind of, um, you know, World War Three involving China is, is not necessarily out of the question. Um, I kind of fall into Seneca's camp there where he says, imagine everything that possibly could happen and 
act as if it, <laughs> it probably yeah. will. And then you'll have a pretty good idea of uh, the kind of horrors that might befall you in your life. But um, I guess I wanted to ask like- you. <laughs> Sounds an awful lot like Murphy's Law, doesn't it? Yes, exactly. It's not a bad <laughs> idea. Way but ahead of its time. Way ahead of I its guess time. I'll throw it over to you, Joe, and just tell me wh- wh- why do you think uh, that this is an important conversation to be having at this time? Well, I, I think the world is preparing for a war with China. In the United States, the uh, the only thing Democrats and Republicans can agree on is to prepare for war. I mean, it's. Um, socially acceptable to be on the same side of this kind of thing. And for the past three or four years, the United States uh, uh, has been preparing for war. That is, uh, it's been uh, looking what it has to do to uh, contain the Chinese. And uh, it's, um, it's, it's the, I think it's the overarching question about this coming war with China. And should there be a war? And is there something we've overlooked here? So I, I approach this diplomatically. I mean, I want to look at the long history of Sino-American relations and a little bit about uh, Australian-Chinese relations because China, uh, Australia usually is lockstep with the United States. Uh, it's uh, no wonder that the Chinese regard Australia as the 51st American state when it comes to uh, Chinese relations because they've, uh, they've fallen right in. But it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a long, complicated story. Uh, if we should go to a war with China, I think it is not only unnecessary, that it is uh, also uh, illogical, because uh, I think a lot of these issues have been dealt with. Now, we, we've uh, uh, spoken to, I've spoken to you on a number of occasions about, there's a very little sense of history going on in the world today. I mean, most people uh, who look at this problem are ahistorical, and that's because of their age. You know, they, uh, I've actually lived through all of this. I've, uh, uh, at 77 years old, I've seen the, uh, the whole thing unfold. I, I remember the uh, President uh, Nixon's trip to China to try to resolve this issue. And so uh, that's kind of a good place to begin. And um, the, the thing is, is that uh, uh, there are a lot of unresolved issues from the Cold War. The, the Cold War was not only against Moscow-dominated communism, it was against um, Chinese communism as well. And in the 1960s, the American Strategic Air Command had counted on uh, destroying as, Amer- as many Chinese cities as, as uh, Russian cities, as a matter of fact. Uh, I've mm-hmm. seen uh, some of the bombing reports, that is, uh, the, the target selection reports, which became available 20, 30 years after the event. And um, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, had there been a war with Russia, China would have been included. By the way, Poland too, and Bulgaria and Romania, everybody was ready to go. The United States had 40,000 te- uh, strategic nuclear weapons and was pre- fully prepared to use them. Now, the, the thing is, and my big grievance is that uh, I think this issue was settled on February 27th, 1972. At that time, uh, Richard Nixon surprised the world by traveling to China with Henry Kissinger, he also brought Secretary of State William Rogers along with him. And um, President Nixon had some serious conversations with Mao, while um, Kissinger had serious conversations with the premier of China, Zhou Enlai. And it was agreed at that time, and I think this is the important thing, is that the United States recognized there was one China and that Taiwan was part of China. That was the deal that was cut. and. Um, of course, and now we're just going to project a little bit to 1979 when the United States de-recognized Taiwan. Uh, and there was kind of this strategic ambiguity about what the United States would, would do next, as a matter of fact. And so um, the, the thing that people don't realize is that the prosperity of Taiwan was actually built on the Shanghai communique of 1972. Now, if you look at worldwide uh, commentary today, you'll find out that there isn't much discussion about what happened in 1972. Uh, and that's because uh, you know people don't study it anymore or they have very short memories. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was on Beijing radio for 15 minutes a couple nights ago explaining the Shanghai communique. And I realized that the people I was talking to weren't really familiar with the document. That's because we've had much more open access to material in the West than the Chinese have themselves. But it's yeah. um, it's it's quite clear that uh, the deal is this. The United States has maintained the status quo since 1972. That is, uh, 
the deal is that China would not uh, force itself on Taiwan, so it would not invade Taiwan, uh, and Taiwan would not declare independence. And of course, these uh, in the last couple of years, Taiwan's talking about independence, which of course would be a trigger for Chinese invasion. There's also this myth about China needs five more years to invade Taiwan. My goodness, they can they could uh, they can invade Taiwan tomorrow morning. That's not a problem. So uh, hmm. the, the Taiwanese are playing a very dangerous game here. They know that their future lies with China. That is, they're only 100 miles from the mainland. They share a common history, as a matter of fact. And of course, in 1949, when uh, uh, the Chinese were losing their civil war with, with um, the, the communists, they, um, Chiang Kai-shek fled to the island of Taiwan and brought his, uh, his uh, troops with him and his coterie and all the rest of it. And so uh, it gets a, a little confusing, but it's clear that the outlines are clear that the United States had recognized that there was one China and that Taiwan was part of it. So it was always agreed. Now, if you look at the Shanghai communique of 1979, it states very clearly that the Chinese are seeking a peaceful reunification. It is their historical mission, the way it was America's historical mission in the 19th century under the banner of Manifest Destiny to gather in uh, Texas and California, Oregon and uh, California, let's see, uh, Texas, uh, Colorado, New Mexico, and all the rest of it. And, and so um, they see it as their historical mission. And, and the Chinese have had the same offer on the table for Taiwan. For, for about 49 years, and that is, they, they insist that the Taiwanese recognize that there is only one China, but they're entitled to have a, their own system of government. That is, they can keep their capitalism. They don't have to follow, they don't have to follow the, uh, uh, the rule of uh, Chinese socialism, with, uh, or Ch uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics. They can have their own model. And, hmm. But there is uh, some urgency here. And um, this is the problem is that people are imagining that we're running out of time. And um, th this is uh, the thing that we have to address today is, well, what is this urgency? Is it manufactured? Is it uh, artificial or is it real? And so uh, we begin the story with, in the 1960s, early 1960s, I was a student at the University of Vienna studying comparative communist systems. And we looked at China, we looked at Yugoslavia, we looked at Russia, of course, and Vietnam, et cetera. And uh, it was quite clear that um, there was a, a monolithic uh, effort on the part of the communist nations to, um, to gang up on the West. I mean, that's how it was seen, seen as a monolith. And no what, one- What were the signs that you were seeing? Sorry, just quickly. What were the signs that you were seeing that made you think that there was that kind of coalition, I guess. Uh, well, the, the, the big sign was uh, when North Korea attacked South Korea in June 1950, it was quite clear that they had the, uh, the green light from, uh, from Beijing uh, and that uh, they were acting in concert with the Soviet Union and uh, opposing American forces uh, on the peninsula and trying to destroy the uh, South Korean government. So uh, we had plenty of indicators. And of course, the uh, Chinese had made America front and center in all their propaganda. It was just assumed they were all part of the same cloth, as a matter of fact. Mm. What we did not anticipate in the 1960s, what we did not see, is the beginning of the uh, Sino Soviet split. Uh, there was an argument between them about how communism should best succeed or how it should move forward. And of course, uh, Mao uh, was famous for the great step forward. He wanted to go right from uh, uh, feudalism to some communist paradise. And of course, it, millions of people died in the collectivization of Chinese agriculture and the rest of it. And, and so the Chinese are trying to take a, a spiritual leadership. They're taking hold of the communist movement. And of course, in those days, the Soviets were very ideological. I remember a guy named uh, uh, Mikhail Suslov, who was the... Um, uh, the Minister for Ideology. And uh, it was sort of like a fight between the Protestant and the Catholic uh, Church, the Protestants and Catholics in the period of the Reformation. It was about who controlled it. Now, um, uh, 
we just assumed they were just all part of the same thing. And as I say, when I, I saw that uh, uh, that bombing sheet, uh, the targets, I mean, every Chinese city was scheduled for uh, destruction. And so they were, they were part of the same cloth as far as I know. And, and no one wanted to do much about it. What made uh, uh, Nixon very interested in going to China, which is completely out of character. I mean, he is, and maybe this is uh, something we should think about it. It took a, a conservative politician, archetypal anti-communist, to travel to Beijing to cut a deal. And uh, while it was uh, President Nixon's idea, the tactician there, of course, was Henry Kissinger. And uh, Americans were shocked that the United States would be turning to uh, uh, an arch enemy, such as China. And of course, uh, in, in those days, um, China represented a very large portion of the human race, and it was not recognized in the United Nations and, and other places. And you know, even today, Taiwan only has 15 nations out of 195 that recognize its sovereignty. And this includes Swaziland, Tuvalu, and Switzerland. So it's not like the, the Taiwanese could count on these people for very long. Anyway, um, uh, President Nixon had a problem, and that problem was. Uh, how to get out of Vietnam. And of course, the Vietnamese are being supplied by Soviets and Chinese, et cetera. And so they, he, he turned to, to Mao as a way to do two things, to extricate himself from Vietnam. That is, if the, the North Vietnamese can see there was no further help coming from uh, China, they would be more uh, inclined to negotiate some kind of exit for the United States. Not dissimilar to you know, the kind of thing you saw in, in Afghanistan how the United States was looking for the door. So, and the other thing too, is that uh, uh, Henry Kissinger was developing this concept of detente. That is uh, to, detente simply is a French word for taking the tension off of a crossbow. And he's looking for some, uh, a way to uh, uh, maneuver the Soviets, to let the Soviets know that uh, the United States was uh, uh, going to support China on certain issues. And, and so it was, a, it was a very clever move. And you know, sometimes in history, you got to be your timing has to be absolutely right. And, and Kissinger and Nixon had their their finger on on the pulse. That is, the the Chinese were looking for their opening, and the United States uh, had come to the conclusion that the only way to get out of Vietnam was to cut a deal with the Chinese. And um, the second part of that deal, of course, looked towards the normalization of relations. Now that didn't happen until December 1979. An old friend of mine, Len Unger, the ambassador in Taiwan, wearing a tuxedo and a red tie from a, a, a dinner party the night before, uh, woke up the, uh, the leader of uh, Taiwan in the middle of the night, 2 a.m., went over there and told him the United States was de-recognizing uh, Taiwan. Of course, this is a great shock. Uh, the Taiwanese were frozen into inaction. They didn't know what to do. And of course, there were thousands of students on the street and, Unger was lucky he wasn't uh, stoned to death somewhere along the way in these cars. So um, uh, it, 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 was, uh, it, it took about, oh, about seven years to complete the normalization process, but it was seen as a sort of a realistic move. I mean, you can't ignore uh, one quarter of the human race in favor of a nation at that time, probably 15 million. Today, Taiwan is 25 million. China's 1.4 million. So, uh, and that doesn't make any sense. This coincides at the same time with something else that's very interesting to happen. In 1978, 90% of the Chinese people were living on $2 a day. Within 20 years, China would become one of the leading economies in the world, on the cusp of becoming the leading economy and a great trading partner with many nations, the European Union, the United States, and, and Australia too, as a matter of fact. And so uh, China became uh, something you had to reckon with. Now, what to do with, with, with China, I mean, requires a great deal of um, preparation. You gotta get people prepared for what's going on. And so there was, a, there is a, a, a very clever political scientist at Harvard named Graham Ellison, who decided that uh, maybe the problem can be best explained to people by turning to antiquity. So what he did was he wrote a brilliant article in the Atlantic, which then became a book and then became part of the lecture tour, called the, the Thucydides Trap. 
And so what he's, he goes to uh, the Cities great uh, history of the Peloponnesian Wars, which is about 2,500 years old. I love it, you know, when political scientists don't know much history, but they always sort of go fishing in antiquity to look for some way to explain things. And of course, the Peloponnesian War was all about the conflict between uh, Athens and Sparta. And so Ellison argued, it was an argument that was, uh, the Cities trap was even uttered by President Xi in recent years, the first to uh, recognize the concept that, uh, when you have a, a rising power and a ruling power, uh, they are often in conflict. And that is because the ruling power cannot tolerate the rising power. So what, um, uh, so what Ellison said was this, that in the last 500 years, there have been uh, a number of occasions for the rising power and ruling power to go to war. And only, uh, I think, uh, 16 times they went to war, four times they didn't go to war and because they were able to accommodate the, uh, the rise. And so uh, he, he, he argued this way, and it's sort of a, a, a nice way to explain to people that what was happening is, is anchored in history too. You know, people know that they're part of a long continuum of things. So how, how are we gonna get out of this? Now, I, I think uh, he, he kind of had it both ways. He, he got to suggest what was going on at the same time, maintaining the friendly relations with Beijing. He went over there a number of times to explain what he was talking about. So the, the, if you, the city's trap became uh, sort of parlance. It's, it's now used everywhere, as a matter of fact. And um, would uh, the United States allow China to rise? Now, at this time, uh, the Cold War is over in 1991, when the Soviet flag comes down on the Kremlin. And uh, we, we, we have to explain this to people. Now, uh, the American military industrial complex, I mean, God love them, you know, they're, they're not particularly evil. They just, uh, they just make a lot of money. And um, they've gone from the war economy of the Second World War, which is permanent war economy, as a matter of fact, uh, suggested by a number of other people, not, not me, and, and, and important books at that time. And the, um, the, the story is, is that uh, we, we, we have to explain a new organizing principle. So a lot of young people who write policy for the State Department or for the Defense Department uh, got this idea of treating China uh, as a, not only as a rising power, but as the recrudescence, that is the reemergence of great power competition. So the United States was no longer in a binary competition with the Soviet Union. And of course, the Cold War, towards the end of it, it was, it was really a nuclear arms race. That's what that was about. And uh, the, the story goes like this, is that uh, Gorbachev and, and Reagan decided to call the arms race off, both for different reasons. Uh, and that was the end of the Cold War. Of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union was not a result of the end of the Cold War was the unintended consequences of uh, Gorbachev's reforms, uh, Glasnost and Perestroika. And, and so the Soviet Union imploded. And a lot of people assume that, uh, not a lot of people, a number of people in Washington assume that the end of the Soviet Union was the result of Americans outspending the Soviets, particularly investing in space, uh, uh, strategic defense initiatives, war from outer space and that kind of thing. That's not true at all. We have to separate the two. And a lot of people make this mistake, including a lot of former uh, Russians, uh, former Cold Warriors, and including uh, uh, Vladimir Putin himself, you know, in regards to the United States as causing the end of the Soviet Union, which isn't exactly true. The Soviet Union ended by itself. So we have this idea of rising powers. And uh, what are we going to do about it? And so in Washington, the uh, Defense Department today has a new unit called uh, China. There's a great Chinese competition legislation that was passed to, to deal with the rising China. Of course, China is what, about 4,000 years old anyway. So it's not exactly, a, it didn't just disappear, appear out of the, out of the blues, as a matter of fact. So uh, we, we, we get Washington gearing up for war, and everybody's sort of anti Chinese there. And, and, and uh, it's about not only about armaments, but it's about trade, it's about intellectual patents and all kinds of things. And so China has been identified as the, the enemy of the future. 
And as soon as you have an enemy, you have to gear up for it. Hmm. And uh, this is exactly what they've been doing. They've been preparing for war with China. The trouble is, is that um, what would be the flashpoint? And uh, so we looked very carefully at what was happening in Hong Kong. And of course, the Chinese were coming down in Hong Kong because they were just a, a little too proud of their independence. And they wanted to suppress that student movement. They didn't want these students to become uh, part of a, a martyrs. You know, the, 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 the Chinese are, are always looking at, uh, and of course, the Chinese are good communists. You know, they, communists are not particularly um, uh, philosophical. You know, they, 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 they've been thinking the same way since communism was invented. You know, they, there is an enemy and you go after the enemy when you have an opportunity. And, and the Chinese are always looking with the, with the Soviets, look for correlation of forces. What is the right moment to move, et cetera, et cetera. So we get this concept all over the world, the rise of China. European Union takes the bait, starts to think about China. Uh, the United States is thinking a lot about China. And of course, Australia is starting to think about China too, that uh, is, is a threat. And um, mm. see, this is, a, this is a, a major misconception. We're not dealing with the rise of China or the Thucydides complex or trap here. What we're looking at is a failing communist party. And President Xi, who's been there for several years, has promised the, uh, uh, the peaceful resolution of Taiwan and Hong Kong. Well, with Hong Kong, he simply uh, lost his patience with those people. And so now it's becoming harder and harder to resist the, the Chinese mainland. But Taiwan is, is part and parcel of, uh, of China. And as long as the, the Taiwanese did not talk about independence, uh, the uh, the Chinese leadership was prepared to offer them a one China, two system deal. And the deal was this, they can keep everything they have, their business model and all the rest of it, as long as they turn over their foreign policy to Beijing. It wasn't gonna be a launching pad for Western forces. And in 1979, the United States pulled out of uh, Taiwan and Taiwan was sort of left to drift, but at the same time, it was left to uh, prosper. And then, of course, it's a very prosperous place, and it's uh, now more democratic than it was when Chiang Kai-shek was there, as a matter of fact. So they've been evolving in this direction. Now, the, the Chinese and the Taiwanese have uh, very close familial relations, economic relations. You know, they they all you know pray at the same altar, so far as I could figure out. But the the Taiwanese were fiercely independent. You can be fiercely independent without declaring independence. As I said on Beijing radio, uh, what would the United States do if California declared its independence from the United States? There'd be American troops there in the morning. You, you can't have that kind of thing. And, and, and it would be very hard for the American Navy to defeat the Chinese in Chinese waters. In fact, in every war game played out between the American Navy and the Chinese Navy, uh, we'd lose a war in the, in the defense of uh, Taiwan because they have all these, uh, uh, well, they're close. They're close to their ballistic missile systems. They're close to their air force. It would be very hard to uh, refuel these American F-35s or whatever else was defending the Taiwan Strait. The Taiwan Strait is 100 miles, 122 kilometers. And so there isn't much there. So it's it's their neck of the woods. Now we we have... Problems with the Chinese and the South China Sea, which I'll get into in a minute, which is probably more of a flashpoint than, than Taiwan. But today there is a presumption uh, among many people in Australia and the United States and in Europe that if uh, Taiwan was under attack, the, uh, West, the West would come to their aid and nothing could be further from the truth. The United States has uh, no intention of going to war with China over Taiwan. The other day, when President Biden talked about a, uh, he talked about uh, a conversation he had with uh, President Xi. It was their first conversation in seven months, as a matter of fact. Well, they both agreed to the Taiwan Agreement, and it's really odd because the world's press never picked up on that. You know, they assume that everyone knew what it was. Well, they actually don't know what it is. And the deal is, is that the United States would like China to refrain from a violent takeover of Taiwan. 
and they want the Taiwanese not to declare independence. And so my, I have this fear that the Taiwanese, uh, we call this moral hazard in our business, might um, pick, a, pick a fight with, uh, with Beijing in order to get other people to support them. That is to pull their chestnuts out for them later on. This, this isn't gonna happen. But uh, we have a great deal of uh, misunderstanding and particularly in Australia, where they're talking about uh, a possible war with China over Taiwan. If you listen to some of these uh, uh, various stations or commercial stations in Australia, you would imagine that war is right around the corner. Australia, of course, is already buying F-35s. It's gonna buy uh, nuclear powered submarines to serve as part of uh, uh, AUKUS, this Australian, UK, uh, US contingent of nuclear submarines, which will prowl the uh, Taiwan Strait and that kind of thing. And so uh, Australia is um, is sort of uh, made itself an enemy of China more than it has to. Uh, and there is very little understanding in Australia of the Shanghai communique. I have not seen it mentioned once in any commentary in Australia uh, by the think tanks. And I don't want to be cruel, but I don't think they think very much about what's good going about history, as a matter of fact. They, uh, they just, they just don't. And of course, it's easy for people to talk about a coming war with China because it's, uh, uh, it, it's kind of a lazy way of thinking and it makes you relevant to say that you're part of this deal. It and does seem like stuff. somewhat of a low hanging fruit. Uh, I mean, you know, even, even with uh, last year, I mean, I think last year this started bubbling up a lot more because everybody was thinking about, you know, we've got this virus that has come straight out of China and, you know, so everybody's already pretty annoyed with that. Um, and then you've also got, uh, I know nothing about this really, um, but, you know, I do remember the kind of cyber attacks that we saw from China. I'm not sure if there's any updates and information about that, but I, I wanted to ask you to clarify on a couple of things for me. Uh, firstly, you've, you've mentioned multiple times. Well, let me ask this first. So that agreement that you said Biden was talking about, to me, it sounded like, and I want to, I want you to tell me if I'm misinterpreting this. It kind of sounds like that agreement was kind of like you can take Taiwan, but just don't make a big fuss out of it and don't be violent. Um, I might be wrong on that, but also the other thing that I want you to clarify is I'm wondering if you could spend a little bit of time uh, going into uh, greater depth about um, why it is that you believe that China is actually a, a dying communist state at the moment. Cause I know you've mentioned that multiple times in the past, you've done your research about the exact amount of years that you'll likely see the communist state stick around. So yeah, if you could clarify on those two points, that'd be great. Well, the, um, my, my um, belief that China is a dying power, that is the Communist Party. Keep in mind there, 90 million members of the Chinese Communist Party, most of them people who simply sign up so they can get, get to go overseas, get an apartment, they get a university education, you know, play by the game. And you got, you know, is, other, is that how it works? Just quickly, is that how it works? So basically, if you join the Communist Party, then you kind of get a lot of international privileges and stuff like that. Oh, you get all the privileges. You, you can't make it without being a member of the party. It's not possible. It's just not possible. And, and what happens course, if you're not other, a member of the party? Like, and who would not become like, who is not a member of the party? Is because I have no idea about any of this. I I consider myself to be very well, much if, in the if, part if, of the a historical group. If you if you want to make it in China, you have to be a member of the party. In fact, the Chinese regard the diaspora is also uh, also members of the party. They expect Chinese overseas to play in with them to uh, support their positions. This is why the, uh, the these large Chinese populations uh, around the world uh, scare the hell out of governments because they think they are. Uh, sort of sleepers for the Chinese government. Anyway, uh, I learned in, in Vienna studying communism that communism, uh, most communist systems only last for about five generations. It's hard to push that zealot tree through the system. And um, most parties, uh, most communist nations uh, after five generations, they just implode. No, they don't become lesser people. They become nationalists. You know, almost all the communists in the former Soviet bloc are now super nationalists, whether they're uh, Lithuania, or Estonia, or Latvia. Or, you know, they're just uh, they're just different kinds of people. 
anyway, uh, I, I think uh, President Xi realized that uh, uh, the party was coming to the to the end. Now, I, I, I've been working on this figure five generations. I mean, that's about what happens. And you know, the Soviet Union lasted, the Bolshevik Party lasted, uh, oh, about uh, 49 years in power, as a matter of fact. 1917 to uh, 1991. Uh, the, the Chinese, and I, I found this out the other day, a uh, serious uh, multi-volume work was going on in, in Harvard. A Chinese specialist found out that, uh, he discovered that of the 249 dynasties in China, their average age was, was about 70 years old. And that's what I've been saying that by the time you get to be about 70, the Communist Party in these nations, they start to lose uh, their ideological fervor. It's very hard to uh, produce that kind of thing. And, and um, so I, I think Xi is looking over his shoulder. Now, I, I wanna just get back to the size of the party. You got 90 million members of the party. And then you got a standing committee of the party which consists of about five people. So how long can you have five people determining the fate of a nation of 1.4 billion? It's very, very hard to do. So Xi has uh, promised things. Now in, in the thirties, Hitler promised things too. Lebensraum and purification of the race and all that. Chinese aren't talking about conquering anything. They're talking about the peaceful reunification of China. The other day, uh, President Xi uh, had a conciliatory speech on the 100th year of the uh, Communist Party talking about uh, peaceful reunification. And in fact, almost everything he said in the speech is, 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 is taken from the Shanghai communique. It says the same thing. It seeks peaceful re re reunification. I mean, the Chinese do not want to make an enemy of the world by, by seizing the, the Taiwan, but it, the Xi's made it very clear to the party that he will deliver on this historic mission to return Hong Kong, she has, and now Taiwan. And of course, Hong Kong was a very bad example because it probably incited people in Taiwan to become a little more independent than, than they might wanna be because they can obviously see that they're next. But um, I reckon that uh, the average age of the Communist Party uh, is about 70 years before it rolls over and becomes something else or is, uh, God forbid, uh, uh, regime change takes place. And I think Xi is working against the clock. So rather than pitching China as a rising power in this recrudescence of the great powers, uh, great power competition, China is really a declining Chinese Communist Party, which is acting out of fear, not out of arrogance or bravado or anything like that. He, he, he's got to deliver on this, and he knows that. So the couple months ago, he gave a, a fierce speech about anybody who stops him from doing what he wants with Taiwan will be met with Chinese force, which is considerable. And um, uh, then he, he sort of cooled it in the last couple of months. He's talked about that peaceful reunification. And, and the Chinese are prepared to let the Taiwanese go on forever with their business model and their freedom of expression, the judiciary, all the rest of it. They can, they can have whatever they want, but they just can't declare independence and they can't go against the foreign policy of, of Beijing. So I, I think uh, President Xi is on the clock. He, you know, he sees, he's got an hourglass next to him and he can see the sands going through it. He's got to deliver. Now, I, I know that there's a new constitution which enshrines him forever. But there's no forever in communist politics. You, know, you can you can get a bullet in the back of the head, whether you're Chairman Kim or anybody else. I mean, uh, they they demand um, uh, they demand that they, he deliver on what he says. So that's his way of unifying the party and 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 uh, pitching to the nationalism of the Chinese people about the importance of reunifying. As I said, he's offered them a deal and to keep on doing what they're doing forever. Uh, and he reckons they'll fall into the same basket. And I was thinking in, in the 1950s, the United States uh, nearly went to war with China over these uh, islands of Matsu and Quemoy in the Eisenhower administration. 
uh, the Chinese were shelling the place, the United States was threatening them with the Seventh Fleet. In those days, I think the United States could have moved very quickly against China. But a war with China in the 1950s would have been an automatic war with the Soviet Union because you know, it was say, all part of the same target selection as a matter of fact. And so uh, uh, President Nixon knew, he knew things in the 50s that we didn't know till the 1980s when these, these uh, uh, target selection things came out, that he knew that there would be a, a general devastation of China in the event of a war. And, and I, I think he was genuinely appalled at the prospect of a nuclear war. Now today, China has, 300 strategic weapons. All of them can reach the lower 48 states. They can certainly take out American troops in Guam, Okinawa, South Korea. This, that's not gonna be a problem for him, but, but he, he doesn't want that. And keep in mind that uh, Xi is in charge of a, a dynam dynamic economy, which is having its own problems from time to time. And uh, the, uh, the Belt and Silk, uh, Silk and Belt, uh, Silk Road, concept uh, is designed to uh, carry globalization to the next level. China wants to play the game. Uh, a number of years ago, a Chinese delegation very close to uh, the leadership came to RMIT when I was there and uh, asked for a critique. They wanted to know what they were doing wrong. They wanted to know why everybody thought they were the bad guys with the Belt and Road. And I explained to them, I mean, they were just imitating the British in the 19th century and American dollar diplomacy in the 20th century. They were doing what everybody else was doing, but they were getting a very bad rap for it with these soft loans and all this kind of thing. Now they did some things that were wrong. You know, they, they agreed to build some infrastructure in Africa. They send their own workers. And their workers require Chinese food, Chinese infrastructure, the whole deal, you know, it's just, they were doing it kind of wrong in a sense. And I, and I said to them, uh, I said to them, look, you know, I know what you're doing is part of what you see in history, as a matter of fact, but by giving all these soft loans out, the day will come when the party will demand that people pay their debts. Fair enough. The U.S. Uh, uh, wouldn't recognize any country that uh, didn't pay its World War I debts. You know, they don't want to be paid. And I said to the Chinese delegation, uh, 17 uh, academics who advised the president over there that uh, Belt and Road, instead of producing a world that is attached to China, will produce a tsunami of anti Chinese feeling around the world with all these soft loans. And uh, they say, hey, look, the, the loans are attractive because a lot of governments uh, hive off the money or they're corrupt. And it's not their fault these countries can't pay back the money. But you know, when you offer people a soft loan, to build an airport or a road somewhere, whether it's in Greece, as it is, other places. I mean, the Chinese have this Belt and Road all over the world. Uh, they didn't understand why the world was ganging up on them. So I made it very clear to them. Of course, uh, uh, more important, I think, than Taiwan is the, uh, the problems in the South China Sea. The South China Sea is this vast place, 3.5 million uh, square kilometers, million kilometers, a million miles. And, um, uh, they, they had all these, uh, they, they said they had a historic basis for being there. Uh, once again, they refer to history for their reasons for being there. And um, it's in their neighborhood and you know, they're gonna take it. And, and to, to solidify their claims is that um, they, they built up all these little uh, tiny reefs. And if you build up a reef, and you call it Chinese territory, then you own uh, 12 nautical miles of the coastline, okay? Plus a 200 nautical mile e uh, ex ex uh, exclusive economic zone. So what they did is they created all these islands where there were no islands, and they created all these concentric circles in the South China Sea, and they're gonna have, they're having disputes with Brunei and Malaysia and Philippines and, and uh, Vietnam and others. And in fact, the Philippines took them to the international court. The international court said there's no basis for the Chinese uh, claims to the South China Sea. And um, of course, the Chinese dis disagreed, with, uh, disagreed with the conclusion. In fact, they, they ignored it as a matter of fact. 
And so, um, so, so they essentially building their own islands in order to expand their territory. That's right. That's exactly. We live right. in an insane and, time. <laughs> we, and, we, and, we live and, in an absolutely and, crazy and, time. And, and, and what do they want? Well, the South China Sea is a is a is a rich bowl of natural gas, oil, and fish. They want all the resources in this part of the world, and um, uh, and they're not going to take no for an answer. It's it's part of their their turf. You know, there is a concept in in geopolitics called propinquity. And, you know, if you're near someplace, you got a better claim to it than somebody who's not. And so they're extending them. And of course, the the point of contact with America is the um, American Navy. You know, let's forget Taiwan and Hong Kong and Uyghurs for a minute. The problem is the, when the American Navy wants to transit the South China Sea, which is right through an area where about a third of the world's uh, freight transits, uh, if it's international waters, the American Navy demands passage, freedom of navigation. Now, this freedom of navigation is part of the American DNA from the Barbary pirates of the 1790s through the war with um, Germany in 1917 and the war with Japan in the 19, uh, early 1940s. It's, it's all part of the same thing. And so uh, I had the privilege of uh, being at a debriefing of uh, Admiral Harry uh, Harris, who, who told us that he told the Chinese if they permit the American Navy to travel in these zones, these freedom of navigation zones, um, not only will there not be a conflict, but the Chinese can use this same same terminology to travel the rest of the world, you know, because they're traveling the, the international freedom of, of zone or what they call sea lanes of, uh, of commerce and slocks, as they call them. And, and so there was that point of conflict. And the Chinese uh, have warned off American ships in areas where American ships have every right to be. Now, uh, I told the delegation, I said, look, um, as far as the South China Sea is concerned, I said, I know you're going to take the oil and the gas and the fish, and you're going to do whatever you want to do. But I said, when the, when the American Navy wants to transit the, the, the free oceans of the world, I said, you got to make room for them, okay? And then this guy says to me, I was just giving a simple critique of what they were doing wrong. This guy jumps on me. Instead of thanking me for my two hours, he jumped all over me and said I was trying to humiliate the Chinese. I said, look, that's the story they use about the open wars and how the West uh, humiliated them. I said, that's the story you tell the children at night, okay? I said, the, the, the Navy is a different story. If the American Navy is more important than Taiwan or Hong Kong or whatever the Chinese do to their own people, okay? And I made that very, very clear. Now, the interesting thing here, and almost never discussed in Australia, is a number of years ago, the PLA, that is the, the main body of um, the fighting force in, in China, turned over the main budget to the Navy, PLA Navy. And their task was, one, one task was to take on the American Navy. And, and of course, the American Navy is the, the backbone of the American military because it is able to project power on uh, aircraft carriers, these uh, Virginia-class submarines, and the former uh, Ohio-class submarines carry 200 uh, nuclear missiles, whatever it is. I said, you know, you don't want to fool around with these guys. In fact, it was the, uh, the presence of one of these, uh, these uh, groupings that uh, caused uh, Chairman Kim to think very carefully about what he was doing, as a matter of fact. And so about five years ago, the Chinese turn over all this money to the Navy and they tell them to take on the American Navy. And um, this is exactly where history comes in. In the 1930s, the Japanese Navy was given the bulk of the budget to take on the American Navy. Now, the, the Japanese Navy had a number of people who knew America and going to Harvard and places like that. They, they knew they couldn't take on the American Navy. 
uh, permanently. They couldn't destroy them permanently. And they, they had taken on a mission that they knew they could not win. And I had a student, a very brilliant student, an Australian student, who um, uh, went to Japan for 10 years. And he wrote an important book about Admiral Namura, who was in charge of the Japanese Navy. And he tried to figure out how a guy like Namura, who knew you know, they, they couldn't win. In fact, he said after Pearl Harbor, the giant has awakened. Uh, he, he knew they couldn't beat the Navy. So why did, why did they take the money? And the money, they took the money because they had to save face. They couldn't turn the money down. You know, this is a bureaucratic problem. You know, if someone mm -hmm. gives you all this money to do something and you can't do it, you know you can't do it in your bones, but you take on the task. It's a suicide task. And so the PLA Navy is trying very, very hard to take on the American Navy. Now they have one aircraft carrier, it looks like an aircraft carrier, and America has 13 aircraft carriers. And they have all these submarines which could do the job too. And um, they, they, they know this. And uh, I, I was told by um, one of these guys that uh, he actually said to my face, he said, look, we can take care of the American Navy. Uh, uh, we can sink an aircraft carrier. We have missiles to do that. And I said, he said, if we sink a few aircraft carriers, the Americans will quit. And I said, nothing could, you know, I said to this guy, I said, that's the damnedest, it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. I said, if you sink an aircraft carrier with 5,000 men and women on board, I said, every major Chinese city will be destroyed in 72 hours. I said, don't you get that? You know, Americans are very sensitive about American blood being spilt. You know, they are less sensitive about Afghan blood or South Vietnamese blood or something like that. But as soon as you start killing Americans, you get this, 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 this uh, gigantic response. So I said, you know, and, and the fact that they're doing the same thing that the Japanese Navy could not deliver on struck me as uh, very odd because the, 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 uh, the Chinese are very sensitive to history. When the Soviet Union collapsed, the Chinese spent billions of dollars trying to figure out what happened to them. I mean, when, when the Soviet flag came down, uh, it they, they, they came down with its armies intact, its strategic command was intact, they had 40,000 nuclear warheads. I mean, the Chinese could not understand what had happened to Moscow-dominated communism. And they certainly didn't want to go that way. They were trying to learn the lessons. And so all the Chinese I've talked to over the last 10 years tell me, well, the Soviets collapsed because of... Uh, Corruption and bureaucracy. Well, that's the story they tell themselves anyway. So they wanted to avoid, Chinese are determined to avoid what happened to the, the Soviet Union. So in this sense, when people say to you, you've heard this, that uh, are, we, are we in a new Cold War with China? Uh, the truth of the matter is, we're in the same Cold War with China. There was no collapse of China. In fact, there was a, a rise of the Chinese economically. So it, it, it's the wrong kind of, Parallel, as a matter of fact. But the, uh, the point is, is that the Chinese, uh, the, the, point, the possibility of conflict with the Chinese, that is, if some overzealous commander of a Chinese vessel sinks an American ship, warship, which is an extension of the flag, or an Australian warship, uh, you're at war. That's what that means. You're, you're literally at war. So uh, they're going to have to think very, very carefully about that. And so the possibility of conflict with China is very high in the South China Sea because of points of conflict. Uh, and that is through miscalculation or misunderstanding or some overzealous uh, guy down the chain you know, who, who sinks an American ship. So there, there's always that kind of thing. And so compared to Taiwan, it's the South China Sea that brings us closer to conflict. Now, I, I one of the strengths of my bow is nuclear weapons. There are about 14,000 nuclear weapons today, strategic ones, uh, distributed across nine countries. The Soviets and Americans have the most, over 6,000 each. And uh, so I worry more about Vladimir Putin doing something stupid than the Chinese. The Chinese do not want war. What they want is the fruits of war. They want to be able to pursue their historic mission in Taiwan. And the idea that 
we would come to the defense of Taiwan. Now, I saw yesterday an article in a major defense journal by a former colonel in the US Marines who said that we should make it very clear to the Chinese that a, a takeover of China would result in a nuclear war. So that should be the deterrence. But the Chinese are not going to be deterred because they know that diplomatically this has been resolved. See, they can't understand what this is about. We've already agreed to these things. And now that we're pretending that they don't exist, I mean, they know it in the inner circles of the American government. All the other governments should know what's, what's going on here. So they, they, they're, they're a little confused that we've changed the game. And as some uh, famous admiral said in the 1930s, when the Japanese Navy became very aggressive, he says, well, well, you know, the Americans taught the world poker and now they want to play contract bridge. And it's a different game, you know, it's the same game as a matter of fact. So it's about power and struggle for power. But we got several things going on. We have China that is expanding economically. It's a force to be reckoned with, as a matter of fact. And, um, and it can be a force for good because they do a lot of sensible things. You know, they want to take uh, a lead in uh, climate change. Right now, there's a conference going on right now in China on biodiversity, which is the second string to the collapse of the uh, uh, the climate change collapse, and et cetera. So they, they want to play a serious game. At the same time, they don't want to be pushed around on something that they, they think is, is theirs. So we have mm -hmm. to be very, very careful. We have to calibrate this thing. Now, uh, we, we also have to, in the West, that is in Australia and the West, is we have to uh, manage expectations about how this turns out. So the Chinese do not want to be forced to invade Taiwan. They, they, they don't want to do that. They want a peaceful uh, reunification. They, they, that's, that's what they're looking for. But if they're pushed, they, they've made it very clear which direction they're going to push in. And so there is a, uh, some think tanks in America thinking, saying right now, well, while the defense of Taiwan is ambivalent or strategic ambiguity, we should build up the Ameri we should build up forces in that part of the world that acts as a deterrent to an invasion. That is, that's where we should deter them from invading, not built around the defense of uh, Taiwan. And I mean it very seriously. I, I said on Beijing radio, I said, if the Taiwanese pick a fight with China, expecting the world to come behind them, that is to save them. This is that moral hazard concept. I said, they're making a terrible mistake because it's not gonna happen. Now the Chinese, the Taiwan has had visitors in recent weeks, a delegation of former senators from the French parliament. And even Tony Abbott showed up here talking about this kind of thing. And of course the president of China, is, of Taiwan is saying that there are a number of nations now who are prepared to support us. Well, that's not true. In fact, it's not only untrue, it's unhelpful because we should be backing off and reminding the Taiwanese that their prosperity over the past 49 years actually depends on maintaining the Shanghai communique. So when I see Australians leading the, uh, banging the war drums about China, not only is this uh, disingenuous, but it actually encourages the Taiwanese to pick a fight that we can't win. So in, in a sense, by claiming to go to war in defense of Taiwan, we're actually encouraging the very war. We're trying to avoid because mm -hmm. it'll put the Chinese in a position where they have no room to maneuver. Now, there are only two ways you can solve a problem in the modern world. Nuclear weapons or, or diplomacy. And diplomacy is a moderation of relations between the great powers. I mean, you've got to use diplomacy here. Now, uh, a few nuclear weapons would do uh, incalculable damage to the earth. I mean, there's no doubt about it. We, we, we know that. And my great fear, and I've been teaching and writing about nuclear weapons for 48 years, is that somewhere, someplace, somebody's going to roll the dice. They're going to say, well, we can do certain things or we can make smaller nuclear warheads that won't have as much fallout, for example. And while we have about 14,000 nuclear weapons, strategic weapons, measured in 
hundreds of thousands of tons of TNT or megatons, millions of tons of TNT. We have, the world is filled with tactical nuclear weapons, which we don't count, we never had, we never counted them. Uh, no one, you know, no one's figured out how to, how to rein these things in. Mm. So the story is that the Chinese in the conflict with the United States would initially win something, that is they'd line the Taiwan Strait with American ships at the bottom of the ocean. And they would threaten to use tactical nuclear warheads against American troops in Okinawa or in South Korea or Guam. So, and they might even use one or two small nuclear warheads uh, to warn us off. And the thinking in the Pentagon, and I think this is nuts, I've actually confronted the guy who, who formulated this policy at a security conference in Vilnius 18 months ago. The theory is, is that they think the Chinese and even the Russians would escalate, use nuclear, small nuclear warheads to signal de-escalation. Now, Simon, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. If someone takes a punch at you, the second punch is going to kill you. It's not going to de-escalate. You know, once you start using these things, once you cross that nuclear threshold, no one knows how it's going to work out, but they will use them, okay? So my great fear is that somebody, someplace, whether it's the Indians or the Pakistanis or the North Koreans or the Russians, um, decides to use a nuclear weapon, they, they just might roll the dice, say we can get away with this. Well, actually, we can't get away with this. Now, in recent weeks, um, as you know, the United States, Britain, and Australia have designed uh, a combined fleet of underwater uh, submarines, nuclear-powered submarines. Now, the Chinese will never assume that an Australian nuclear-powered submarine isn't carrying nuclear weapons, okay? If it's got a missile or torpedo, they're gonna assume it's nuclear armed. That's the way it is, like the INF entry. The reason it worked is because the Soviets made it very clear that they don't believe Americans would put conventional warheads in there, and the Americans, the same thing with the Soviets. If there's a warhead, they just count as the nuclear warhead. Now, what, what has aggravated the Chinese in recent weeks is this decision for Australia to develop uh, this nuclear capability means that they will be able to go further afield from Australia to prowl in waters uh, close to Chinese territory, et cetera. And of course, there is a theory in America uh, propagated by, I think, a former assistant secretary in the Obama administration that a combined fleet of underwater, air, uh, underwater uh, submarines, nuclear submarines, could take out the, jet, the Chinese Navy in 72 hours. So the Chinese know that Australia now is part of this effort to wipe the Chinese Navy out. And um, they know that. You know, and it's interesting. Australia's gone from a doormat, a country that can't get China to answer the phone or take back their, uh, their policies on barley or whatever it is, wheat and wine, to now being part of this, this fleet that will uh, imperil Chinese territorial integrity and sovereignty. So China's, uh, Australia is now playing this kind of outsized role. And of course, Australia is already interoperable with the American forces. And it's only a matter of time before there are more American troops in Australia and a matter of time before uh, F-35s are here or there's a military capability here that can be launched against the Chinese, et cetera. So uh, mm. the Chinese are taking a very dim view of Australia, as a matter of fact. And, uh, uh, and you know, and Australia's buying F-35s down the road. They're going to buy these nuclear subs down the road. They'll lease them at first so they can learn how to use them. Or they might be just interoperational with American and British crews. Uh, for a war, they're planning 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Now, if my theory is correct, that, China, that communism only lasts about 70 years in every country, in which case it has to be reinvigorate itself or to be eternal, you know, be a regime change within. And China has a, a great history of that. As I mentioned, 249 dynasties 
on average, 70 years each, though mm. one of them did go a long time. And, and so the, the Chinese are up against the clock. They see themselves as losing their power in China. And um, they, they, they don't think they have a lot of time. And this idea that it's a rising power, and you know, to use Thucydides and Sparta and, and Athens, that's a very neat kind of thing. Now, the guy who told this story, Graham Ellison said he wanted the world to see the Chinese-American rivalry through a prism of antiquity, that this has been the same problem for 2,500 years. Then I saw him in a, in a podcast the other night, and he was telling all these people on a TED Talk that uh, Thucydides is a wonderful guide for what's going to happen next, or what should happen next. And then he says to this audience, this will make you uh, gag. He says, and of course, Thucydides is the father of history. I always thought it was Herodotus, actually. So he, he wasn't even sure what he was talking about. But he had this great idea. And I love Graham. He's 78 years old. And he'd written the big book on the Cuban Missile Crisis. He'd written the big book on the coming of nuclear weapons for terrorists. And now he's made himself relevant again. And, you know, he sold a million copies of this book, selling all, all over China. And people are reading this. So what, what is the relationship between a rising power and a ruling power? And in 500 years of history, 16 times, they confronted each other. And they were only able to avoid war four times. So our, our odds are very poor that we can do something about this. Now, what, what, what bothers me is that if there is a war between China and, and and the United States. And when I say the United States, I mean as friends and allies will come in line. It, 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 it is not only unnecessary, it's a tragedy that we, we, we shouldn't be going down this road for two reasons. Number one, there's no justification for it. And number two, it's suicidal, particularly as we look at the other crises that threaten you know, the international community. COVID, climate change and biodiversity, all of which can wipe us out. So we're gonna need some cooperation. And if the United States is ever going to defang North Korea, it's gonna require Chinese assistance. Chinese have made it very clear to the Americans that if the North Koreans fire on America, America could do what it wants. But if America fires preemptively on, the, on North Korea, they're gonna be at war with China in the morning. It's mm. very clear about that. And they're serious because in September 1950, Chinese sent a couple million volunteers into Korea to fight with the North Koreans. So they're, you know, they don't want Americans or South Koreans on their borders. North Korea is bad enough, as a matter of fact. So we've got all the other problems to consider. But right now, when I see this uh, incredible momentum towards war, and it, it's the big issue. The other big issue, of course, is you do have a rise of economic China, which is run by a, not a corrupt party, but a dying party. And I'm much more worried about a group of people who think their days are numbered because they have very little room to maneuver. And, and this is what we don't take into account. So when we talk about a rising China, I'm thinking we're talking about a failing party, which is promising its people to reinvigorate it, economic uh, reforms and what they call common prosperity and uh, reunification with the Taiwan. As I say, they're, they're prepared to let Taiwan stay there for the next 200 years with their business model and all the rest of it. But the Taiwanese push it. So we have an obligation as uh, analysts, commentators, and citizens of the world to explain to people that this war has been settled in 1972. There is no war. There is one China, and Taiwan is part of China, and the United States signed up to that. And I think, I think Nixon, despite his, uh, his problems with Watergate, I think he was visionary. He understood in the 1950s when he was General Eisenhower's vice president, how many Chinese cities would be destroyed. He understood that. And he, he was repulsed by the thought of nuclear Armageddon. You know, he, he was... You know, you, you do it in the last resort, but you don't, you don't threaten this kind of thing. It's just, it's just too dangerous and too reckless, as a matter of fact. So he, he had this great vision of taking Taiwan off the table 
forever. And he did it. And he did it at great personal cost to himself. I mean, uh, he's uh, an arch anti-communist with wonderful credentials. And he travels, you know, we we have the the quintessential anti-communist sitting down with Mao and Zhou and Lai talking about resolving the issues of the day. I mean, this is extraordinary leadership. But today we don't have anything like that. Biden's not going anywhere. People around him aren't going anywhere. Not because they don't want to. They're just a little short of ideas about what to do. And they've lost their credibility over Afghanistan, as a matter of fact. And the Chinese uh, are very angry about the, the nuclear deal because it looks like they're trying to stack the deck against them, as a matter of fact. So the, the Chinese are, uh, they, they, they see the, the sand going through the clock. And they realize they don't have much time to preserve themselves. Now, Xi is doing a lot of other interesting things. You know, he's coming down hard on corruption in China. Uh, he's coming down on monopolies. He's punishing uh, uh, people who are fixing prices and, and all that kind of stuff. He's, he's doing what nations do. You know, I, I once saw a comment by the great Arthur Schlesinger Jr. who said in the 1970s in an op-ed piece that you could have capitalism without communism. But you can't have democracy without freedom. And communists can adopt uh, certain business practices, monopolistic. But at the center, of course, is what they say is socialism with Chinese characteristics. So it's quite clear. And, you know, in the recent uh, weeks and months, uh, President Xi has uh, mandated how often children can listen to social media. He, he can turn big tech on and off. He's telling people where to get on and off the bus. You know, he's becoming more um, authoritarian because he's trying to prepare China for the 21st century. And mm. this, this may be his own undoing, because sooner or later, I mean, anybody who wants to know what's going to happen in China simply has to look at a book written in 1931 by Elders Huxley, Brave New World. You know, you can organize this world all you want. People are free. You know, people will always be free to decide what they want to do. And even if they're going to lose, they would rather have that one, you know, moment of freedom as they go down mm. the tubes. And so he's trying to order Chinese society. I think he's got an impossible task. And we should be kind of hanging back on this and acting like a great power, or former superpower. I never liked that word superpower. This is a, a phrase uh, coined by a guy named Bill Fox at Columbia, 1949-1950, a little book, where he referred to Britain, uh, United States, Britain, and Soviet Union as uh, superpowers. I don't know why he included Britain in that. And you know, as a superpower, the United States wasn't able to do what? It wasn't able to beat the North Koreans. It wasn't able to defeat the North Vietnamese. Uh, it wasn't able to uh, uh, assist the Shah of Tehran. I mean, uh, the superpower business, I think, is an exaggeration. It's a moniker that you sort of have over a period of time. But um, mm. I think we're in very dangerous waters. And I'd like Australians and other people around the world, this is my personal mission, to try to explain why this war is unnecessary. And it's tragic if we come to this point, because if there is a conflict with China, there will be nuclear weapons. There's no doubt about it. Hmm. Chinese will use the nuclear weapons, and the United States will use some nuclear weapons, and Australia will hold its breath, see what happens next. And this is going to create uh, incalculable problems, problems on the universe. Um, Carl Sagan in the 1980s wrote these wonderful pieces and lectured extensively about nuclear winter, where these nuclear weapons block out the sun, agriculture dies, ice age comes in, and all the rest of it. It's not hard to see how nuclear weapons can change things. But I, we, it doesn't mean people won't use them, but we got to give people less incentive to use them. And the one thing we cannot do is paint the Chinese into a corner. And of all things over Taiwan, which was settled 49 years ago, it doesn't make any sense. So when I hear people mm -hmm. say that we should threaten nuclear war or we should be prepared for war with China if they invade uh, Taiwan, this, this, is, this is reckless conversation. Now, people will say, our economies are tied up. How can we do this? 
Keep in mind that before 1914, it was the heyday of international peace movements. The economies of the world were all kind of tied up together. Uh, a guy named uh, Norman Engel wrote a book called uh, War and Illusion, that war is no longer necessary because it affects everybody, et cetera. And so we're, we're forgetting these, these important things. Well, people go to war uh, in spite of themselves. I think they would, unless they have a, a solid understanding. And in this country, and I've been here 48 years, uh, I, I, I see this ignorance on, uh, in the think tanks, on, on commentary, and in the government about what they think they're doing. I mean, when I, I, I hear these things, I'm thinking, this isn't, this isn't real. Now, it's dissociative behavior. You know, a nation of 25 million can't really throw its weight around. It has to join somebody. So, you know, and smaller powers usually hook up with great powers. This is what uh, Leopold von Ranke meant when he talked about uh, power politics, about the great powers. And he didn't have the concept of middle powers. You're either a small power or a great power. And small powers gravitate towards um, the, the great powers that would look after them, as a matter of fact. Uh, yeah, Australia, of course, sells itself as a middle power. Uh, I don't know where this comes from. When I arrived in 73, I went to the University of Queensland. And about a year later, I was uh, at Story Hall listening to Gough Whitlam talking about Australia as a middle power. All right, here we got about, uh, what, 14 million people. There are fewer people in the Australian Defense Force than there are cops in New York City talking about themselves as a middle power. Now, there was a, a very interesting uh, Queensland politician who wanted to be prime minister and could have been, as a matter of fact. He got ruled at the last minute by Bob Hawke. And he uh, went on to become governor general. He wrote a little book. In his memoirs, he wrote his memoirs, and he has a little passage in it about this, this idea that Australia is a middle power. He said Australia is only a middle power if you compare it to uh, Tuvalu or someplace like that. He says it's it can't it can't go to war with Norway or France or anybody like that. You know, it's just it's kind of a, a misnomer. But you know, Australia you know goes along with you know, thirty thousand men and women are prepared to fight tomorrow. Australia has 59 ships. I don't know how many of them are on station at one time. A 12,500 mile coastline, the distance from uh, London to uh, Sydney via Suez. How could 56 ships protect Australia's coastline? Not impossible. Mm. Not, not, it's not possible. It's just not possible. So in a way, there, uh, Australia has, uh, has joined up. And I hate to use this expression, 51st state, but Australia is all in with the United States on this. It's all in. It's military, it's intelligence community, and it's politicians. They're all in. And when uh, Australia decided to buy these nuclear submarines, these nuclear powered subs, I, I was astounded at the silence uh, of the Labor Party. <laughs> Normally they would jump all over something like this. Penny Wong tried to get out of the conversation as soon as possible. And Albanese uh, said, Yeah, it's okay as long as we don't have a nuclear industry. Well, so you're going to buy a nuclear powered submarine and the Americans are going to deliver the nuclear fusion box that goes in the submarine. So it's like, you know, asking for replace your dead battery with some company that comes along. It really isn't going to work that way. But Australia is now part of the uh, Australian, US, UK uh, solid front. And that's what bothered uh, uh, President Macron so much is that he has his own policy for this part of the world. He too is opposed to Chinese aggression. Uh, and But he sees himself now as the leader of Europe. I mean, uh, France is the only European power to rule. They don't trust the British. After Brexit, NATO doesn't trust British. The European Union doesn't trust the British. I mean, if the, the Brits can get rid of Europe that easily, then why should they come to the party if NATO decides to go to war against China one day. So they don't trust, don't trust Britain, as a matter of fact. And so uh, Macron has his own policy. He was about to launch his own EU concept of Indochina, freedom of navigation. I think they sent one aircraft carrier there. And uh, this, this, policy, this, this deal comes along. 
And he says there were knives in the back. Well, there were knives in the back. You don't treat a, a major European power this way. Uh, and Australia just, he didn't want it. Uh, and they didn't tell the, the French they didn't want it. They just, uh, they just walked into the room with Boris Johnson and Joe Biden and announced to the French the deal's off. Now look, $60 billion is a drop in the bucket to France. But it, it destroyed uh, Macron's confidence in the United States, has no confidence in Britain anyway. Got him very angry with Australia for tying up in this kind of thing. So you can see, we, we have all these uh, permutations, lay layers, and you know, in, in many ways, we've returned to the, the 1914 era of great powers with lots of variations going on down below. Where mm. people don't trust each other, don't trust. and so uh, I think uh, the expression is often used about sleep uh, sleepwalking into war. Uh, I don't think Australians realize the damage they have done in this way. And of course, they're not going to have these ships for what 10, 15 years it takes, um, and they they will get them sooner or later. But they've declared their hand. Australia's all in with the United States, and the United States has hasn't told anybody a secret yet, and that is. No one in the United States is going to go to war with China over Taiwan. Hmm. Nobody in Peoria, Illinois, is going to go to war with the United States over Taiwan. Nobody in the United Nations is going to go to war with a nation that's not in the United Nations and has a special kind of sovereignty. So if nobody's going to go to war with Taiwan, why are we threatening? Why are the Chinese threatened with war over Taiwan? That's because the Taiwanese are pushing the independence movement, leaving the Chinese very little uh, mm. opportunity here. And of course, um, uh, if you paint somebody in a corner and you cause them to lose face, they're, they're going to they're going to go crazy on you. And so, in, in many ways, the Taiwanese are calling this forth. You know, they say that the Chinese will be ready in five years to invade. They can invade tomorrow. That's not a problem. Mm. What they're trying to do is line up some help between. Now and then, um, I, I'll so, tell you. Uh, funny you can I kind of uh, jump in here because sure. <clears throat> it seems to me like you, what you're really worried about, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you know we're all talking about this coming war with China, and so the news is going to start talking about it. The politicians are going to be listening to the news. They're going to get that in their head. Everybody's going to keep on talking about it until eventually the hive just gets more and more close to this idea that we're going to have a war with China. And then are you afraid that that then turns into a misstep on our end where we maybe do something with a little bit too much gumption uh, that crosses the line and makes them bite back? You know, is, is that essentially what you're worried about? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's a, a, a concept mentioned by a guy in a 1921 paper. This guy, uh, Named Thomas. He was an educational psychologist. And he wrote a line which has been used by political scientists ever since. He says, when you perceive a situation as real, real are not the consequences are real. Mm. So when you perceive a situation as real, real are not the consequences are real. So what Australia has done is is bought into an unreal situation. And it starts to imagine that this is reality, whether it's reality or not. Australia is going to cop it at the end of it. Now, this is not an argument for Australia being neutral or anything. I think Australia can make a lot of points diplomatically, and they can do it without the gorilla in the room, the United States. Mm. You know, Australia could, um, you know, for example, the other day, when uh, six months ago or so, when uh, the Global Times threatened to, to rain uh, ballistic missiles on uh, Australia if it should assist the United States in defending Taiwan. Uh, I said on one of the networks that uh, the prime minister should call the Chinese ambassador in and ask him to disavow the statements because the Global Times represents some views of the Communist Party. And if he didn't disavow them, to just shutter the embassy because you can't threaten a nation with nuclear weapons when you're not at war with them. I mean, that is, in a sense, an act of war to threaten people with war. Mm -hmm. So they, they should have shown them the door. Now, that particular network put my comments online, that is on YouTube, 
and within a week, it had 1.6 million views. Now, look, I, I don't get 1.6 million views from my comments, but it generated this interest around the world about what Australia should be doing. Now, Australia's done the easy thing. It's in lockstep with the United States. You know, and prime ministers, and I've been here a long time, they love to go to Washington. They love to have a steak dinner. And whether it's Billy McMahon with the beautiful Sonia or whatever it is. And, and Australians always say things that are slightly over the top. When Menzies uh, gave a speech in Congress in the 1950s, he said, except through the jaundiced eyes of the law, Australia and Americans are the same. And that we will be with you through thick and thin. And you get Harold Holt getting drunk at the White House, saying to LBJ, wherever you go, where, wherever you go, uh, uh, all the way with LBJ. And then the guy who replaced him, John Gordon, who's a very sensible guy. He also gets uh, drunk in the White House. And he says, wherever you go, we'll go waltzing Matilda with you. I mean, who writes this? I mean, this is extraordinary. <laughs> Yeah, and and you know, all the governments have been the same. Now the Labour Party rediscovered the Anzus Treaty in the 1980s. It was always opposed to certain aspects. Of it. And in the 1980s, uh, the early 1980s, there was a story going around, big story, picked up by the ABC and others, that because the United States was an ally of Ronald Reagan, that, that Australia was a nuclear target. Australia had made itself a nuclear target. And I was at you know various meetings with trade unionists and others who who wanted out of the ANZUS Treaty and this kind of thing, and pointed out that the ANZUS Treaty doesn't really, isn't really an ironclad document, though President Truman made it very clear it had to say cachet is NATO. I saw that in the, in the Truman papers. And uh, so the story was in the 80s that Australia had become a nuclear target because of its overenthusiastic association with the United States. And it was it was the big topic. And uh, I, I even wrote a very mischievous uh, op-ed piece saying that uh, the ANZUS Treaty didn't cover the Indian Ocean. So while I'm at the University of Queensland, uh, somebody said, turn on the radio. And Andrew Peacock, who uh, is, is in Parliament, saying that the ANZUS Treaty covers both the Indian and, and Pacific Oceans, et cetera. And that he mentions my name, though he mispronounced it. I was just doing that to have a little bit of fun to see if anybody was awake. Now, at this time, there is a very senior Soviet minister visiting Australia. So he winds up on the ABC, 7.30. So, so I think it was uh, Carlton says to him, he wanted to put him on the spot. He said, is Australia a nuclear target because of our association with the United States? And the, the Soviet, I think he was a general. I'll never forget the look on his face. He said, we don't think about Australia. <laughs> it took all the air on his story and disappeared. And it was reinvigorated, by the way, on the war on terror. When people argued, again, the trade unionists and others argued, that uh, because of Australia's support of America's war on terror, Australia has made itself a terrorist target. It's the same, same rhetoric. They just changed the nouns a little bit. So it's the same story. Well, I'll tell you this. There's no... There's no uh, ambiguity about where Australia stands with America on the China issue. The only trouble is they don't really know where America stands on the China issue. When uh, President uh, Biden said, I talked to Xi and we agreed to the uh, Taiwan agreement. Well, the agreement is, the agreement is that China will not forcibly take over Taiwan in exchange for a promise from the Taiwanese not to declare independence. That's the agreement. But he didn't elaborate on it for some reason. And the Australian press didn't raise any questions about it. And um, uh, as I say, the foundation of this decision is the Shanghai communique of February 27th, 1972. Anybody can see it online. In fact, the language in it is, is beautiful. It's really kind of uh, really well crafted. And you know the Chinese Americans agree that there's there's only one China and Taiwan's part of China and everyone will play by the rules, et cetera. I mean, and and, and what China was going to offer the Taiwanese is the same thing that President Xi said a couple of days ago. I mean, it's the same language. They haven't changed anything, as a matter of fact. But 
the Australians haven't figured out America's not going to war with China over, over Taiwan. Now, in, in 19, December 1979, uh, Ambassador Unger, whom I got to uh, know pretty well when I was at uh, the Fletcher School of Diplomacy for a couple of years in the 80s, uh, he made it very clear to the, to the, to the leadership in Taiwan that uh, the United States was de-recognizing uh, Taiwan in favor of China to complete the normalization process begun by Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon. That was the deal. And that the Taiwanese took it very badly. And then after they thought about it, what are you gonna do? You know, your, your number one sponsor has decided that you are just a bastard child after all, you're not the real deal. <laughs> and of course, uh, once in a while, and I'm a realist, what I mean by a realist, I like to see ends and means come together. You can't overpromise. you can't underpromise. You know, the essence of diplomacy is you never, you know, you, the essence of diplomacy is you, you, you ask for a little more than your position allows, but never less than your position requires. And the United States made it very clear the Chinese behave themselves. The United States is not going to bother them over Taiwan. And if the Taiwanese behave themselves, no one's going to bother them either. So for the Taiwanese to take the lead here, this reminds me of the, uh, aggressive role of uh, the Serbians in 1914, drawing other people into this conflict by supporting the, uh, the rebels in uh, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. You know, this, this young man that started this war, um, he, he was trained in Belgrade and, and clearly the Serbians were trying to pick a fight with the Austrians, but they didn't count on the Austrians getting a blank check from the Germans and no one counted on a war that was gonna go on four years and kill 25 million people. There's a lot of miscalculations. And so I think it's very important for Australians to, uh, gee, I hate to use this word, to get the facts. You know, uh, the only thing worse than misunderstanding history are the fact finders, you know? <laughs> so you have a historical debate that's been going on for 50 years. And somebody says, well, I'll check the fact finder. And the fact finder will do the work of a, thousand historians over 50 years by saying, yeah, that's true, that's not true. Well, that's not exactly it, because history has been fluid, things change all the time, but what hasn't changed is the um, modality of diplomacy, the importance of diplomacy, and the legacy of what is going on. To not recognize the Shanghai communique as this, and it was a circuit breaker, that was the idea. It was that it was, the United States was not gonna go to war with Taiwan, it was not gonna be responsible for, for destroying maybe 40 million people, killing 40 million over Taiwan, they wanted to put it off the table. At the same time, they wanted to uh, give the Soviet Union something to think about in this triangular diplomacy that was set up, but there was something for everybody. Everybody had maximized their position. And the language is clear. China seeks the peaceful reunification of Taiwan. And it said right there, one country, two systems. They could have whatever system they want. They could play, uh, they, they, could, uh, they could have the Victorian casino there tomorrow if they want. He doesn't care. As long as their foreign policy does not conflict with Beijing's foreign policy. Now, the Chinese do not have a big history of interfering in internal conflicts. You know, they're very cagey about that. You know, they don't have some sad story to tell about uh, Afghanistan the way the Soviets do, or the Americans in, in Vietnam or Syria. They don't like to be trapped like that. They want to be able to, able to do their own thing. And my goodness, they have enough to do without getting trapped overseas. And so people will say to me, uh, and I, I've been the fierce critic of, of Chinese foreign policy. You know, If you're going to attack a ship in an international sea lane, then you should expect, you can expect what happens next, okay? If what happens next is on you. But when you've already done a deal on a place like Taiwan, which is the, the button issue, you've got to take it off the table. So the ignorance in this country, and I call it ignorance because you know, people don't know, don't want to know, don't know where to find the, 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 what, what's going on. And uh, you know, when I was younger, every university in the world with its name taught diplomatic history of the great powers mm. today. I don't know what they're doing, you know, it's just, uh, 
And, you know, and if, um, this this might actually, if I could just jump in, this might actually sure. be a really good place to get some, you know, if <clears throat> if you're kind of on this mission, you want you want to get people to see that. Um, well, I, firstly, I think it's probably necessary for us to just accentuate that point of just how terrible it would be if we got into a war in the future with with China. Um, that, that should be the first thing. Let's let's get a bit of fear of God into people. And then, you know, uh, and then perhaps, you know, what is it that you think that people could do? Where could they be getting the right kind of information that's not sensational or, you know, sensationalized or, um, you know, overblown? Uh, but where, where would you send people uh, in terms of literature or online or anywhere that, that I mean, do you see any well, news stations that are doing a good job of covering this sort of thing or? No, most uh, news stations, uh, they don't have what we used to call foreign correspondents. Mm. And if they do, they're usually seen in front of uh, the Imperial City or Kremlin or mm. Washington. You know, they're not asking these kinds of questions. And I would say to people, they say, well, you know, this guy is uh, talking about the Shanghai community. What does it really say? Well, you go to the U.S. Department of State Office of Historian and you look up the Shanghai Communique. It's there about, I don't know, 1,500 words. It tells you exactly what was agreed on, what was codified at the time. And then you go to 1979, where you had Jimmy Carter saying to the world, uh, well, we are going to de-recognize Taiwan in favor of the People's Republic of China. Uh, how do I feel about Taiwan? I'm a little ambivalent about it. <laughs> they don't want to encourage an attack. And in 1979, the Chinese were in no way, no position to attack on Taiwan. And today they can do it very, very easily. So, you know, you begin with the historical documents where you just go online and get some great lecture about, you know, just anyone should, should just look at uh, uh, President uh, Nixon's trip to China. There's some wonderful documentaries. You know, and there's just the plain news of the, of the time that's available about what was accomplished. I mean, why would the, the world's leading anti-communist leader of the free world fly to Beijing to cut a deal or to put Taiwan off the table? Number one, it was the number one flashpoint for Sino-American conflict, which would have included war with the Soviet Union like that, because it would have been included in it, as a matter of fact. And, 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 and so if someone like Nixon had the vision and Kissinger, too, had the tactical skills to arrive at this position. Imagine, you know, your, 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 your arch enemy shows up at the door. And that's what I like about personal diplomacy. You know, uh, it, it, a lot of this stuff was uh, reinvigorated in the, in the 20th century with uh, Chamberlain going to see Hitler a couple of times. That didn't work out, but he thought it did it's until Hitler reneged on him, okay? He thought it, he thought it was very successful. And... Uh, and so we have to engage the Chinese, you know, and you heard the other day that uh, General Milley, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, called up his opposite number when um, in the waning days of the Trump administration to warn him, to tell him, to advise him that America is not attacking China, you know, it's not on the cards. Well, that's good. Now, a lot of people want to torture Milley for doing that. They said that he acted outside the loop, he acted without his commander in chief and this kind of thing, but you have to engage the Chinese. And I would just make it very clear to them that uh, we reinforce the idea of peaceful re reunification. And then we have to remind Taiwan, you know, Tony, uh, Tony Abbott goes over there and says, you know, we're gonna help you here. It's, it's, it's not only misleading. Does he have any authority to say that? I know he used to be the prime minister, but is he basically well, just in America, in America, to stay, stay in the game or something? <laughs> in, in, in America, he could be prosecuted under the Logan Act of 1800, where an individual, private citizen, goes somewhere and gives false hope. It, it just, it's interference. Yeah. I don't know why he went there. Now, look, thousands, there are thousands of visits to Taiwan every year by American congressmen and their... Uh, and their committees, they all love the free trip, you know, and they all get to go to Taipei, it's wonderful. Uh, but it um, doesn't change policy. And, and, and Biden, you can't get Biden to say anywhere he's gonna go to war over Taiwan. They'd like him to behave a little bit. 
So you, you engage the Chinese and you know, I don't know. And I think in that seven minute phone call that they had, that he said to him, we will abide by the Taiwan agreement, but Biden never explained to the American people what it was and no one outside America asked what it was. What is it they mm. agreed to? And what they agreed to was that uh, it's China's one country and Taiwan's part of China. It's done. You know, we've agreed to that. And uh, when we de-recognized Taiwan in 19, December 79, early January 80, the deal's done. You know, it's, it, it's a done deal. Now, and the fact that we should also point out that Taiwan's uh, fortunes and prosperity over the past 50 years resulted from that agreement. You know, they didn't have to worry about the Chinese coming over the hill. So we're coming through the to the straits. I mean, it, it provided them with the assurance and the ability and the capability to, to, to build a great society. And you know, they can keep it as long as they want. So we have to engage them. And, and you know, we have to do these other things. You know, we, we got this COVID thing, which is roaring through the world right now. And you know, there is no plan B. And I know there's all this stuff about we have to find the origins of it. Look, uh, Simon. The Spanish flu killed nearly 50 to 100 million people, and we still don't know where it started. Finding patient zero isn't going to solve the post-COVID-19 world, okay? It's not going to solve it. And climate change, you know, we only have, it's, it, it, with climate change, it's, it's two minutes to midnight. We got to do something or do nothing. We'll just mitigate it after that. You know, all the rich people will go to, the hills and you know, in Sydney, they'll go to the Blue Mountains and in Melbourne, they will go to, uh, you know, they'll, they'll go to uh, Dalesford and every, you know, we, we know it's going to happen. We're, I'm we know thinking of my happen. uncle who technically lives in the highest point in the Sydney region up in the hills. And I'm thinking maybe that's why he went up there. <laughs> and, and, and we all know that climate change is killing us. And of course, all these promises made by the year 2050, the people making the promises are not going to be alive. But the Chinese are interested in this. Uh, they're interested in perpetuating uh, globalization, which has a lot of positive things. My, my grievance with American politics and even Australia and others is nobody has explained to ordinary working class people what globalization means to them. What's in it for them? All they've seen is their jobs go elsewhere. You know, the, the world is much bigger now. We've got 8 billion people, 2 billion people that live below the, 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 the living wage. Who will do anything for $2 a day? I mean, you know, one guy has coined a term. Below the, 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 the proletariat, we now have the precariat. We've got people who will do anything to survive. And, you know, yeah. and, and so we have all these other problems to solve. So we re-engage the Chinese. And of course, as I said on Beijing radio, it doesn't mean we're not going to have a conflict through misunderstanding or miscalculation or whatever it is with the Chinese in the South China Sea, because that's where the points of conflict are. But the point of conflict is not what happens to Taiwan. Taiwan can have its freedom. What it cannot do is declare independence, because what will independence do? Send the wrong message to the people left in Hong Kong, send the wrong message to dissidents in China. And the Chinese communists, good communists, all of them, they're looking over their shoulder at the counter-revolution. They know that there are forces behind them that want to brush them aside. I don't know who they're going to replace them with, you know, Chinese nationalists. And they might have the same kinds of policies. But they're, they're worried that Taiwan will set a, uh, start a, a brush fire in China that they can't put out. That's why they're concerned about it. I mean, if California declared, decided to declare independence, which I'm sure some Californians would love to do, we'd have federal troops there in the morning. Can't do that. Mm. You know, you're, in fact, in, in, in uh, 1861, some nation, uh, some, some state tried to secede from the United States. And what did that do? It got us four years of civil war. I mean, it, it, it doesn't work that way. Mm. And so we, we go back to the, uh, the principle that the great powers do what they can, and the smaller powers follow suit. You know, what, 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 what's left for them to do? And so Australia has an important role to play. And, and I always thought, 
Uh, Australia had an important role to play in terms of uh, guiding the United States in Southeast Asia and in, in Asia. I mean, Macron is not anti-Chinese. He wanted to leave himself as the uh, equalizing force, that is, the balancing force. He wants to be the interlocutor between the Chinese and the United States. He wants to be heard. He wants to resolve issues. He doesn't want to join the crusade. Hmm. And this idea of militarizing our relationship with China is a mistake because it just goes down one road. It, it, and of course, in America, we got the armed forces and all this legislation designed to uh, rein in Chinese um, uh, behavior in terms of uh, international patents and the internet and this kind of thing. And, and so America's gearing up for an anti-Chinese um, century. And it's, it's all the wrong stuff. You know, it's a thing that they can agree on. But this idea that uh, we have to create a force that will force China back, I mean, uh, you know, just look at the history of the world. As soon as you put foreign troops on somebody's soil, you know, you're going you're gonna to have something terrible happen. And, and in 1979, when the Soviets entered uh, Afghanistan, they were uh, received as liberators. You know, Afghan film took off and music and all the rest of it. They saw the king and his old ways were bringing them down. And the Mujahideen aren't standing for it. So, you know, they're going to create a guerrilla warfare. Anytime you enter, you, you're standing on somebody's soil. We can't defeat China. It's too damn big. We could deter it in some ways, but I think it's easier to engage them. They want to help out on climate change and biodiversity, and they want to help on COVID. And we're on this campaign to find uh, what happened to that uh, that virus, whether it left the lab willingly or unwillingly, uh, that's just that's beating the drum. It's a little late. I mean, the horse has mm -hmm. left the barn. As I say, we still don't know what started the Spanish flu. So, and the Chinese, I, I understand they're hypersensitive about things, particularly as the world you know, starts to align against them. And of course, their neighbors are prepared to do business with them on a one to one basis. They, they understand they can maybe be able to strike a deal. And, you know, ASEAN's not going to go to war with China. APEC's not going to war with China. U.S., Australia, and Britain would go to war with China. Well, here we go. We got three former nations ganging up on China. I mean, the Anglophiles are coming. You know, mm -hmm. we, 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 that, that war is over. You know, the Chinese want to be part of the world, and they indeed part of the world. If we have to solve problems with China on security issues, I'd much rather see it take it to the UN and we can resolve it there. That's what the Security Council is about. So someone will say to me, well, the Chinese are part of the Security Council and they'll veto anything we agree to. Well, the same thing with the United States vis-a-vis -vis Israel. And the Israelis can count on American veto. And same thing with the British or the French. You know, they, they, can, they got their own uh, Ax to grind, you know, there's certain things we do. On the other hand, taking it to the United Nations is very, very important. Now, there isn't any uh, world government out there. I mean, the international community is what we say it is, okay? The, the, Kissinger had a great line once uh, when someone told him to call Europe about something. He said, Who do I call? You know, the world consists of independent powers. And we have groupings, you know, ASEAN, APEC, the United Nations, EU, et cetera, et cetera. But there is no one person to call about what's going to happen next. You know, we, we have to come together. And one guy, one brilliant uh, fellow in the U.S., uh, I say brilliant in quotes, he said that what we should do is reestablish a 19th century concert of the world bring China, the United States, and Russia in and solve our problems in a closed room where people aren't looking. Mm. Oh, I thought this was a bad idea. As soon as you start doing things behind closed doors, you start disposing of nations, Libya, Syria, Iraq, whatever it is, it's a bad idea. You have to have some kind of transparency. 
So it's very hard to, to get world opinion. What we need is a consensus that there's not going to be a war with China, not over Taiwan. There might be a war about freedom of navigation. Fair enough. The Chinese want to sink an American warship, then it's on them. They want to sink an Australian warship, it's on them. But they're not going to do that. They're not stupid. And they're not going to be engaged in cybersecurity to the point where people are going to declare war on them. I think when you go to war, this is one of the lessons we forget in the 21st century, is you ought to have a very high bar about why you're at war. And when I see these these lazy consensus arising about a war with China over an issue of Taiwan, which was settled 50 years ago, I'm thinking, what's the disconnect here? The disconnect is we don't know any history. We know that we don't know. I mean, the world doesn't know. They don't think they know what America's going to do. But America knows full well what it's going to do. It's not going to come to the aid. Of, of Taiwan once the invasion starts. We, uh, through the Taiwan Relations Act, the United States can provide defensive weapons and that kind of thing to the Chinese, uh, to the Taiwanese, but there's not gonna be a war. People in the UN are not gonna go to war over Taiwan. So it's off the table. So when I hear people talking about Taiwan is the invasion of Taiwan would be a casus belli for World War III. I'm thinking what planet do these people live on, you know? It's the wrong reason to go to war. On the other hand, (coughs) we need to engage China, whether the Communist Party is going down the toilet or not. We have to engage China for the big issues, post COVID-19 and climate change, biodiversity. And let's not forget the United Nations long agenda of 17 sustainable development goals. We need the world to contribute to that. So we have to re-engage the Chinese and, and take some of these other issues off the table. But to, to, to give aid and comfort to the Taiwanese right now, to encourage their independent stance, is not selling them out. I mean, when, when you start hearing <coughs> people talking about what would happen to certain people, my God, the United States has just left a nation of 40 million people in the lurch. It's left 10 million women and girls to return to the Stone Age. And they left without looking back, okay? So when people talk about the rights of the Uyghurs, or Taiwanese, or Hong Kong, those are crocodile tears. We've already turned our backs on 10 million people who we encourage to, be, to join the modern world. We just turned our backs on them. And we know what's going to happen if it's not already happened. So what we have to do is think like a nation. What is best for Australia's national interest? Well, the national interest demands that it cozies up to the United States. The United States is the ultimate guarantor of Australian sovereignty. This is how it was done. This is seen in 52. It's been seen in recent years. And Australia is just sticking close to the U.S is the U.S. a liability? Well, I, I think it is a little bit. Uh, I think Donald Trump has done a great deal of damage to America's relations around the world. Um, as the French said about uh, Biden, he's simply Trump without the tweets. Um, he's doing the same kinds of things. Once you have kicked a nation in the head, and then you get a new leader who comes in and says, I'm not going to do that to you. The next guy comes along and kicks you in the head. You start to think, uh, I, I really have to start doing something for myself here. I can't trust our institutional uh, memory of what's going to happen next. So when Biden runs around the world and says, we're back, and, and no one believes him, why should they believe him? You know, Trump wasn't the Lone Ranger. You know, He expressed a lot of uh, reservations and doubts of Millions of Americans who have never thought that NATO's paid their, their fair share. You know, it's fair enough. And if NATO didn't have an army and a headquarters and a pension program and a medical program for thousands of their people, there wouldn't be a NATO. I mean, NATO was about uh, keeping the Germans in and the Soviets out. Well, that's gone now. The Germans are well in and the Soviets are well out. 
That is why when the Soviets took over Crimea, nobody moved a muscle because the Soviets were simply going back to their old turf. Uh, the idea of a war was disproportionate to what was lost, et cetera. We have to start thinking in realistic terms with this idea of uh, we defend them. Now, I, I made a mistake when I was in Lithuania. I was uh, at a security meeting and I was at the midnight, the midnight all meeting from midnight to 2 a.m. And I was on a panel with the head of NATO in Europe and a Lithuanian foreign minister who invited me and uh, some other dudes. There was the uh, Ukrainian foreign minister. Was there. And the Ukrainian foreign minister looking at this audience of European EU diplomats, EU bureaucrats, NATO people, and he wanted a little bit of love, you know, he wanted some People to say, look, we would support you, the Soviets or the Russians come. And no one was getting, no one was giving an inch. Uh, they made it very clear to the uh, Ukrainian guy that you're kind of on your own. And uh, I pointed out about two o'clock in the morning that, uh, of course, in, in, at that time, you know, these, these really intelligent, beautiful people only had two things in their heads. One was Brexit and the other one was Donald Trump's tweets. They actually could, were in fear when they woke up in the morning about what, what Trump was doing to them. Anyway, I, I said to them, look, um, history tells us we can hang together or we can hang one at a time. I said in, because no one would come to anybody's aid in Europe in 1938. And by 1941, December 41, the, the, the Nazis are at the gates of the Kremlin. Uh, 242 million people in Europe live under the swastika. The swastika ruled from the English Channel to the gates of the Kremlin because nobody would do anything. And I said, of course we would support Ukraine. I, I met theoretically in principle in the United Nations. And the next day, the Lithuanian newspaper says Australian professor says Australia will go to war over Ukraine. So the embassy called me up and told me, what are you doing? I said, I meant that as a principle. Not, we're not gonna go to fight with them, but you see, they were desperate to have some support. And the, the press teased that, it's two in the morning. I said, we should support this man, at least in principle. You know, we don't have to send troops in the morning. And he was a very discouraged fellow. He kept talking about, the 30,000 Ukrainians that have died fighting, funny looking, Russian looking soldiers in, in green, green uniforms and all this. And uh, he needed a little bit of support. And the Europeans clearly weren't gonna bend themselves out of shape. So the idea of the Europeans going to war with us against China over Taiwan is a myth. Not gonna happen. If anything, Macron would be the, uh, the honest broker. He would be the interlocutor, the balancing act. That's what he sees the EU's role is. And of course, the EU doesn't have a real role outside of the EU. I mean, it does things outside the EU, but it hasn't found its natural place yet. Mm -hmm. So aside from the war uh, and the Balkans against Yugoslavia, it didn't have a real role anywhere in the world. So it's, it's seeking a role. But this idea that we're all lining up, you know, when I see the American... I mean, the American military, uh, the elites see this uh, anti-Chinese thing as part and parcel of their existence because they're the one who's been explaining it. The military industrial complex uh, loves it. You know, they went from anti-communism to anti-terrorism to anti-Chinese. Now, you know, the, uh, they, you keep talking about the Dow Jones going up into the 30,000. Those are mostly companies that are preparing for war. Modernization of nuclear weapons, other kinds of armament. We're talking about Boeing and Raytheon and Northrop and Martin Marietta. These are all defense people. They're the only people prospering because of the threat of war. So we have to have the, the China thing there. President Nixon once said in a very prescient interview, Sandy Van Hoeker of the NBC during the height of the Vietnam War, he said to him, uh, what if the Vietnamese could vote tomorrow? Would the United States listen to what they're saying? 
And he didn't want to answer that because the Vietnamese would have voted for anybody to get everybody out of the country, foreign troops. Mm -hmm. And so Nixon says to this guy, American prosperity since 1941 has depended on war and the preparation for war. I thought that was a very honest statement. This is exactly what uh, people talk about, the permanent military industrial complex. War and the preparation of war. The idea is to be so prepared for war that the enemy backs down. You build up to build down. You build missiles so you can then trade them away later on, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the, the American economy is designed to do this. And they're all anti-Chinese, you know, they're preparing for this war that they hope they'll never have, of course. But this is their raison existence. This is why they're doing this. They're looking for that. Every society needs an organizing principle, whether it's defense or center. Now, in the 1940s, up till the 1940s, up until 1947, the Department of Defense was called the Department of War. The last department, Secretary of War was Henry Stimson. He's the guy that assisted in dropping the bombs on Hiroshima and other stuff. And then they, they changed it. They integrated the commands. And they call it the Department of Defense in 47. And you know, I, I like the idea that there's a man or a woman in every government who's exactly what they mean, say exactly what they mean. They are the Secretary of War, the Minister for War, okay? Not just defense. Defense is uh, one of those weasel words that Don Watson invented for Paul Keating. It's a weasel word. See, if I'm the Secretary of Defense, then I'm the good guy. Actually, my job is, is to prepare for war. And if war comes, to win it. I explained this once to a Chinese admiral at a nuclear conference I hosted in Melbourne in 2015. He says the Americans are preparing war against us because he heard a number of these young Harvard types talking about how to take out um, Chinese missiles. I said, Admiral, we used to call it Department of War. That's their job is to think about war and how to win it, okay? They don't mean anything by it. That's what they do, okay? They're not planning to go to war. They're ready to go to war if the political leadership says to go to war. So if, if you are the secretary or the minister for war, I think that puts people, that should send a, a, a little bit of adrenaline through your body about who are these people? You know, when people are telling us they're going to buy F-35s and spend billions of dollars on nuclear-powered submarines as part of the Australian defense effort, when in fact it antagonizes the other guy, because by the time this stuff gets up, the war will be over, as a matter of fact. I, and, and all that money spent on this kind of thing. That's what really drives me crazy as a professional educator, professional historian. Australia's got plenty of money for F-35s and nuclear subs, but no, no money for universities, which are falling over right now because of the loss of the Asian students, particularly Chinese students. And so I see this kind of a, uh, a shell game going on. You know, we, we're looking after you. We're going to spend all this money on defense, but nothing on human security, human capital. We're not going to spend anybody who can help us think. You know, what Australia needs, I saw this in Germany when I was in Hamburg. Hamburg right now, uh, the German government has all this money available for young Germans, men and women, to think strategically about the future of Germany. We're going to do the same thing in this country. We should get all these bright young people and ask them to think about where Australia is and where it should be going. Uh, produce strategic thinkers. There are very few strategic thinkers in this country. You get a lot of people in think tanks who think they're strategic thinkers, but they're not. They don't think strategically at all. You know, they're just trying to cozy up to the government every day. And so we, we got to well, think about this differently. Well, what, what, what would you say is, uh, you know, when, when you come across a truly strategic thinker, how do you recognize that person? You know, what, what, what are the sort of habits that they have in the way that they talk about, whether it's history or politics and everything like that? Is it, I know we've talked a lot in the past about kind of drawing the connections and trying to pull wisdom from all different angles and to see what that kind of gives you in that soup. But yeah, what, what do you see in a strategic thinker and what, what, what well, would you recommend I, people do to get I, there? I have been lucky enough 
to have 45 PhD students I've signed off on. Hmm. Some of them have became ambassadors, top public servants, various things. Some of them work in premier and cabinet. Some of them work in prime minister and cabinet. And I know they are trying to lay out the best advice possible. But because they are not part of the, the people who head up the public service, and I don't know if you've ever met some of the top public servants, I don't know what they do. It's scary. So these people, they become a footnote and an assessment of a problem. And instead of being allowed to expand their theories or their ideas, they are forced to parse a few paragraphs of somebody's statement. They're asked to provide uh, on a deadline what's going on yesterday. So instead of reaching back, any one of them that I've produced, and I want to give their names, could talk about the Shanghai communique. They studied that with me. They know this is off the table. And some of them tell me this is driving them crazy, mm. that no one's listening to them. There are people in this country who can do this. We should be encouraging more people to do this. I mean, uh, we don't have any place in this country where you can go to study nuclear weapons or nuclear nonproliferation. Um, we don't have any place where you can study emerging technologies. For example, the, uh, this Havana syndrome that's coming up, this uh, using uh, uh, microwaves on brains to, um, to debilitate the other guy's intelligence as part of the surveillance, counter surveillance it's been developed in the 1960s. I mean, I, I think the, the future of warfare is the brain. You know, if we could defeat an, a company of, of, of invading troops by turning a button on, instead of using a bullet, you've won the war. I mean, there's all kinds of technologies out there that can be used, but we need people who can think in a grand strategy. I mean, look mm -hmm. at uh, Graham Ellison, 10 years, Dean of the John Kennedy School of Government. And to, cement his place in the business, he reminds people of the lessons to be learned from antiquity. He's thinking strategically. Kissinger thought about the concert of Europe and how it kept the peace for a hundred years. That's why he went to China. That's why he encouraged Nixon to pursue his vision. He understood how units of great powers interact. And, and we need people who could, you know, in, in this country, for example, uh, I don't know, there are 37 universities. Where would you go to study 19th century European history? I mean, no educated person can understand the 20th century without understanding the history of Germany or the history of Russia. And after the, the Cold War, all the Russian history courses disappeared. Hmm. No one, you know, the best German historians today in Australia, the Australians, are teaching overseas because there's no interest in them here. So we don't encourage these things. Australian universities today encourage uh, what I call shovel-ready degrees. You know, it gets you a degree to work with industry, this kind of thing. That's all crap. We don't have any great thinkers. You got people who think strategically about the environment, like Tim Flannery and others, big thinkers, but we don't have a lot of big thinkers. We don't encourage uh, our young people to paint on the big canvas, look at the big canvas, ask them to know a little bit about something and then try to get a job or something. But we, we should encourage this. Uh, there should be scholarships about turning out strategic thinkers. And you can get them from around the world. There are people who do think strategically. Um, you know, and you begin with antiquity and you go through the uh, European history and then Asian history, and you come up with some idea about how to, for example, I told you about uh, the, the lesson of the, the Japanese Navy. They were given all this money to take on the American Navy, and they knew they couldn't win. Doesn't that tell you something about what they should have done? I mean, if the Japanese would have played nice, they could have had their massacre of the Chinese. I mean, they probably massacred 25 million Chinese. Probably could have got away with it if they'd have stayed away from the American Navy. But, you know, we, we don't have, there wasn't anyone in Japan who was thinking strategically. You know, people tend to, uh, they talk about this resurgence in nationalism. People are looking more and more nationalistic at their problems. Well, you gotta think international about your problems. You have to think historically about your problems. And you know, when, when I was young in graduate school, there was a guy named Herman Kahn who had developed futurology. He was working at Durand Corporation. And he would look into the future and project the growth of China, the collapse of the Soviet Union. 
And, and that's fallen out of favor. And futurologists were always great strategic thinkers, as a matter of fact. And in the absence of strategic thinking, you get a lot of uh, kind of uh, lazy thinking. In the 1980s, a lot of political scientists in this country, in the world, predicted that the Soviet Union and America, because they both subscribe to the world economy, whatever it is, they would converge. There'd be political convergence. And in 20 years, we'd all be playing nice and thinking alike. Well, that didn't work out. I mean, you know, most of these things don't work out. But, you know, the um, study of history has declined in this country. In America, only 2% of undergraduates undertake a history degree. And that's collapsed because, you know, everybody wants to get into media and communication or something else like that. And we don't have these thinkers. We don't encourage them. Now, I'm not going to mention any names. But there are people in this country who pass off themselves, pass themselves off as intellectuals, which should be laughable anywhere. I mean, I don't want to mention any. I'd love to mention some names. <laughs> the only country in the world. Perhaps for another time. <laughs> I don't want a lawsuit. I mean, really strange people pass themselves off as intellectuals. And uh, you know, I could say something. You know, I've been giving these lectures for years about the coming world of China question mark. And uh, and in and the last year, a lot of people have pointed out what I pointed out, but they haven't pointed out the cause. The cause that China's a problem is because it's a collapsing communist party. They see it as a rising power. They see it as a rising power because all these American types and British types and Canadian types have talked about dealing with the recrudescence of the great powers, great power rivalry. So we're not in the binary thing anymore nuclear arms race. We got all these powers in the world. Well, um, yes and no, but that's been around there a long time. But where would Australian kids study nuclear non-proliferation? That's the number one problem in the world to me, is nuclear non-proliferation. Unless we get this under control, unless we can control nuclear weapons until they become anachronisms, they're the greatest threat to the human race. Hmm. Climate second, biodiversity is third. Taiwan is not on my list, as a matter of fact. You know, and, and you go to these countries around the world, whether it's Pakistan or New Delhi or Bangladesh, and, and you see these elites living cheek by jaw with people living in cardboard boxes. How long? I mean, you know, the fourth problem in the world is poverty. That's what the Sustainable Development Goal is about, how to overcome poverty. The goal is by the year 2030, no one will live in poverty. Well, good luck with that. Uh, now we got... Billions of people more who, who will work for a dollar, two dollars a day. And that's not going to be solved. And not to mention, there are going to be millions of people on the go when the water starts to rise. I mean, look at Indonesia, 17,000 islands. Where do you think they're going to be rowing to when the water starts to rise? They're going to be rowing to Australia. Mm -hmm. and some of them will just walk in. And what's, what's WA in South Australia and Queensland going to do? They're going, to, they're going to put up borders. They're going to close the borders. I've been saying that this, these COVID borders are really a dress rehearsal for climate refugees. When they start coming in the millions in, in Victoria, the top end, and the rest of the states say they don't want them because it'll overwhelm the system. And so Australian you know, states right now, they're not even thinking like a country. They're thinking about themselves. It's very tribal. Mm. In fact, uh, when I see these states close up to other states you know, beggar thy neighbor kind of thing. I'm thinking, what happens if you get a million, like Angela Merkel opened the door and what, a million people came through the door. What, if, what happened in Australia if these people should show up as climate refugees? Where are they going to go? Well, WA doesn't want them. South Australia doesn't want them. Queensland doesn't want them. They're going to wind up in Victoria and New South Wales. And, and they're just going to close the borders. I mean, I, I, I'm very disturbed at how people are responding to a crisis that will have a natural ending. That is when the novel, novel, novel coronavirus goes through, it'll be done. That's what happened in mm. 1919, it just went through. And it's not gonna change anything. People say, you know, we have a new way of thinking about the world, that's baloney. There's no new way of thinking. Human nature hasn't changed. It'll just snap back, as a matter of fact. I couldn't understand why there wasn't a single history book I've ever read 
that talked about the, the impact of 100 million people dying as a result of the, the Spanish flu. Did it affect anybody's policies? And people develop amnesia after a disaster. In fact, the only place you can read about the Spanish flu is in literature or cinema, in poetry. I mean, the, the artists kept the pain alive, but the ordinary people did what? You know, it was the jazz age, prohibition, communism, Nazism, fascism. Everybody's on the move. Nobody's thinking about the 100 million people who died. People will forget all that, as a matter of fact. Yeah. And, and, and so we, we got a lot of big problems. But I, I think, you know, the important thing is Australia should take its bright young people and, and, and say to them, look, there are some scholarships available, we'll make 100 a year to develop strategic thinking. And then you bring in people like me, I'm too old to do it now, but, you know, who, who think strategically. You know, Naval College, the Air Colleges, you know, they have strategic thinkers there. So, you know, we need people who think uh, on the big campus. And what is Australia's role? Now, Australia has a national interests, should be calibrated. Is it always doing the right thing? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but maybe uh, Australia, and I hate to say this because I'm an Australian citizen too, Australia's got to grow up sometime. You know, you've got to, Australian, young, young Australians are going to take this over and figure this out. And I always say to my young Australian audience, Simon, We've got all these problems, COVID, climate, nuclear weapons, poverty. And unless you solve the problem, it's going to overwhelm us. And then I like to point out, as you appreciate, if we don't solve it, we will disappear. You know, all we got left from Assyria are these little clay tablets in the British Museum. And these guys were far smarter than we were. They had more sway than we'll ever have. And they disappeared from the face of the earth because their young people couldn't figure it out. They weren't asked to figure it out. So I always say to people, Australians will disappear. Now, there's nothing written in stone about Australia goes out in the 22nd century. Something may happen. And when you think about what could happen, biodiversity or climate change, it's going to change everything, particularly when millions of people try to come here. And they will come. There's, there's, you can shoot them out of the water for so long. There was a I, I had the privilege of covering uh, Nelson Mandela's release in South Africa. And um, since uh, Mandela took about 11 days to leave his cottage, he wasn't sure how to, what he wanted exactly. He was working on his strategy before he got released from Victor Pastere prison. So I, I traveled around uh, South Africa for 11 days, which is a great thrill. It's a beautiful place. And I talked to intellectuals and others. And because I represented an Australian organization, uh, they were very angry at me, you know, because they, uh, they thought we'd been picking on them with the apartheid, anti-apartheid. And of course, once you get to South Africa, you find out there isn't an intelligent person there who believes in apartheid. They've been trying to get out of it, particularly to play rugby union. <laughs> they wanted out, they wanted out. Anyway, this, this guy in, in uh, Stellenbosch University got very angry with me. He said. Uh, now you Australians with your high mindedness about other people. And he, he says this, this says this to me in the years what uh, 1990, whatever it is. He says to me, you know, when Mandela gets in, and of course Mandela is going to have his own struggles with uh, other black entities there, you know, the 23 tribes there, 20 tribes hated his guts. You know, and this Wazulu land and all these people, you know, they're at each other's throats. He said, when Mandela's released, a South Africa will disappear from the newspapers. No one will be interested. No one will be interested. He said, but the day is coming. Here it is. Uh, to, uh, 19, uh, he says to me, he puts the finger in my chest. He says, the day is coming when people are trying to come to Australia. And you're going to be shooting them out of the water, into the water. You're going to be killing people who are trying to reach your country. And then the world will focus on you and what you do to preserve yourself. And then when I think about our immigration policy the last 10 years, he was absolutely right. But by that time, the world really didn't care about people drowning. 
because they had their own people drowning off of Sicily and Italy, and Spain, and the rest of it. And he said, the world will focus on Australia's brutality. And I'll tell you what, that haunts me because when the time comes, when we have to open our doors and we won't, we will revert to violence and we will be shooting people in the water. There's no doubt in my mind. Mm. If they start coming in millions and they will come, what, what are we gonna do about it? Uh, we don't know yet, you know, no one really wants to think that far. And we'd rather talk about what, branch stack, you know, something, something simple. So, but Australia is going to need some thinkers. And most of the universities here are not designed for that. You know, they're doing other kind of soft topics and you know, wonderful topics that don't really tell you how to survive. You know, mm. And the government's only encouraging Australian universities to uh, promote degrees that will give them a job tomorrow in businesses, partnerships with business. And they actually asked the businesses what we should be teaching. That's backwards. We should be the group leaders. So, if, you know, if Australians wanted to develop strategic thinkers or uh, some way of dealing with the future, we should get into it right now because we don't have a lot of time. We're not going to beat the deadlines on, uh, on climate change. And it's not because we didn't try. Just we got there too late. So yeah. we can do is mitigate the circumstances. But in all these things I mentioned, nuclear weapons, poverty, COVID, biodiversity, we're going to need the Chinese to get involved in this. We can't solve the problem without the Chinese or the Indians or whoever, South America. We need everybody involved. We've got to think globally. We have to think about this the, uh, the positives of globalization. My grievance about the globalization movement in the last 20 years is the elite failed to explain the benefits of globalization to the working class man and woman in the world. They never figured out what's in it for them. All they know is they lost their jobs in Youngstown, Ohio, glass making to someplace else, or their cars, uh, car making went down to Mexico, went to the cheapest bidder, you know, and, and we never explained globalization. And, you know, right now in the United States, there's a, this huge uh, $3.5 billion, trillion dollar social policy, social planning bill uh, to bring Americans up to speed, deal with climate change, and provide uh, human security, human infrastructure. And, and Biden's telling all these millions of people that we need to do these things in order to make ourselves competitive in the global world. So he's, he's pitching to them to join globalization, to be part of this uh, very positive network. And uh, he's not getting through to them, particularly the progressive party. Say, so, you know, all we do is gonna create an army of blue collar workers to, to dig up roads, to do this and that, you know, because the globalization will continue to benefit the super rich in America. And, uh, and so we, we, we haven't been doing a very good job communicating what's at stake. And when I see people who could, who understand that a war with China would not only be unnecessary, but it would be a tragedy because it would short circuit all these other solutions to different problems. You cannot go to war with China on Monday and expect them to work with you on climate change on Tuesday. That's stupid, you know? I'd rather engage them now and we could deal with the other things. We're not giving Taiwan away. We agreed that Taiwan was part of China. California is part of the United States. Tasmania is part of Australia. Discussions off the table. So we need people who can, who can actually think historically from antiquity to the present, who could draw on the lessons of history. Now I know someone would say to me that history never repeats itself, but as Mark Twain liked to say, it rhymes a lot, and we can learn a lot from, from what these people have to say. And you know, the idea that someone like Graham Ellison, very good guy, you know, a learned person, would have to sell the Chinese problem to America as an example of the Peloponnesian Wars gives you an idea of what he's trying to do. He's trying to explain the present in terms of the past. He's doing a very valuable job. 
as far as he's going. You know, he didn't say how it would end. And it, it, even in the four periods where there was not war, I'm not sure he got that part right either. And he said, we got it right during the Cold War. We averted war. Well, we averted war because of what? Mutual assured destruction. That's how we averted that. So, but we need people who, who think large. And we don't have a lot of people like that. And I'm not just bemoaning what's going on in higher education. But higher education has to lead the way. Now, I think I've told you in the past that is a result of neoliberalism and compact competition and this kind of thing. Uh, universities now think like corporations. Students are not students. They are clients. And, and, and vice chancellors are not great thinkers. They are very talented corporate type people. They're not the great thinkers. When I arrived here in 73, your great thinkers and physicists and social science and humanities people ran the universities. They decided what was important. Today, we universities are never leading. And you'd think that with this talk about Taiwan being obvious that uh, we would have discussions led by the top people in the universities. Malcolm Turnbull said in a recent debate, a recent discussion, conversation with Kevin Rudd, it was a very interesting one about China. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull was saying that uh, because of his uh, foreign interference law, which was obviously aimed at Confucius societies and group, that he'd go to meetings in Sydney and there'd be vice chancellors there who would swear at him for screwing up the Chinese student base. You know, they were telling, they were screaming at him to stop his anti-Chinese sentiments because it hurts the, the state. And of course, in those days, uh, foreign students represented the third highest export in Australia, $34 mm. billion. Dollars. And they're, they're screaming at the China, the Chinese, the, the Australian prime minister for safeguarding Australian society against uh, over foreign interference in, in, in America and Australian society. So here you have the leader of the country is trying to think ahead of the, you know, the loop here, and you get the vice chancellors uh, screaming at him for interfering with their income flow. What's that all about? You know, the, yeah. the and these should be the same prime, these same vice chancellors who are saying, look, Syracuse and, 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 and other people just might be right about this. That Taiwan is not the case of Bella. It's off the table. But you don't see any comment. You know, if you look at Australian television, listen to the radio, you read the newspapers for the next week, you're not going to hear anybody making any sense about China. You know, they're going to be talking about yesterday and the day before. And, and if you have nothing more to add than this immediacy of the last couple of days, you can't solve the problem. And what they don't understand is the problem has been solved by the great anti-communist and the great communist leader, Mao Zedong. <laughs> you couldn't have two guys more different from each other than, than Nixon and Mao, and they solve the Taiwan issue in the room, and it's off the table. We don't have to go to war with China over anything, really, because we've normalized relations. we prepared the ground. You know, if, if Richard Nixon had the courage and the foresight to solve a problem with his arch enemy. You know, as much as I don't like Donald Trump for his personal work, I think he's a, a clown. The, the fact that he went to see Chairman Kim in North Korea, his face-to-face -face diplomacy. Sure, he didn't solve all the problems. But North Korea hasn't pointed a nuclear missile at America since that meeting in Singapore, okay? You yeah. know, Trump made it very clear you can keep your toys. But don't point them at us. And Kim got that. In fact, on that occasion, Kim was in a very dangerous position because if you'd given Trump too much, the military, which really runs North Korea, would put a bullet in his head. If you'd given Trump too little, Admiral Harris would have visited him with the Seventh Fleet. He didn't have a choice. I mean, you know, I was feeling sorry for Kim for a minute because <laughs> he was between the devil and the deep blue sea. But that personal diplomacy was very important. You know, in the, in the Biden administration, nobody's going anywhere. Not because they don't want to. It's because I don't think they have a lot of ideas about 
how to solve these things. Um, President Biden said about his team, which looks an awful lot like Barack Obama's team. He says, oh, they're the same people with the problems are different. No, they're not different. They're the same problems. That was his justification to bring back the, the band, so to speak. We have a lot of people who just don't have a lot of creativity about this. We need strategic thinkers. We need people who think outside the, the loop. And look, I think the military's got a lot of people who understand what's going on. But, you know, they're good soldiers. They, they do what they're told. And we might have some public servants at the junior end who've got an idea what, what we should be doing. But they're always overwhelmed by the secretary of this or that department or somebody who's had some service. Or worse yet, this is the one that really gets me, is you get people in universities who, who've never done anything, and then they appoint themselves as spokesmen on the topics of the day, important topics, security, national security, climate change, whatever it is. And um, would, would we be, would we have spent a minute on Charles Darwin without the origin of species published in 1859? Or would we have spent any time with, with, with Karl Marx without his books? I mean, aside from Socrates and Jesus, no publications. We, every, everybody who had something to say, whether it was in the Middle Ages about international human rights or philosophy, they, they, they left a, a treatise behind. They, they set the debate. And, and today, if you look at the Australian spectrum of influences, the, the people talking about these issues they, they haven't done anything. I'm just going to, I have a, an exercise reminder on my machine, but I don't exercise. Okay, no worries. <laughs> just turn it off. That's my exercise. Just turn it off. <laughs> so we, 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 we need more strategic thinking. So to sum up here, is a war with China a good idea? It's a very bad idea in a long history of that. Is it necessary? Now we talk about it too. War is a necessity and war is a choice. Well, that's simple enough. Uh, war and necessity is when the Japanese attack you at Pearl Harbor or the, uh, the Germans start shooting your ships in 1970, sinking your mm. ships. That's a, that's a war of choice. Uh, Libya, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Those are, and, and the president, Biden called this a forever war. They, they, he made that up. You know, that, was, that was just part of the campaign. There was a necessity and there are wars of choice. And we have to think about whether a war with China would be a war of necessity. No, it'd be a war of choice. Is it a mistake? It's a very large mistake because China's a major player economically. And I think it has a very short shelf life of who's running the place. And they're gonna be doing things out of desperation. And I don't push anybody without a dead, you know. If they're desperate, you gotta leave them a little bit of a, an exit. Don't push them too much. But we don't have people thinking like that. And this idea that, you know, you, you've seen the Secretary of Department of Defense here, Bazzullo, talking about the drums of war. What are we talking about? You know, I had a professor in Vienna, an old socialist. He used to say to us, when wars are fought by kings or leaders, who must lead their troops in battle. There'll be very few wars in the 20th century because we don't have people like that. They're not leading the way. They're, they're consigning people to do things for them. So when I always say to students, whether I was teaching in America or Australia in my long career, I was saying, very, be very careful who you vote for. They can get you killed. I mean, if you voted for Lyndon Johnson, he can get you killed in Vietnam. Mm. with the draft. Richard Nixon could even get you killed for a little while before he ended the draft. Or George W. Bush could get you killed too in Afghanistan or Iraq with his little invention in Iraq about weapons of mass destruction. Mm. In any other part of the world, George W. Bush would have been tried for genocide, um, war crimes. He made that whole thing up. And when I hear a uh, uh, congresswoman Cheney in Wyoming talking about how immoral Donald Trump is. I was thinking, well, she can get her father arrested first, send him to The Hague, and you send Trump to The Hague for stupidity. 
Um, but her father actually manufactured that whole weapons of mass destruction. It's a fairy tale. They got a lot of people killed and just uh, uh, destabilized the Middle East. And, and, and so we had people, and God bless them at the top, who lie to us when they get very selective about uh, options that are available to us. And we don't have enough body of bright men and women who can challenge them. And the major institutions in Australia don't challenge them. You know, when the think tanks come out, it's not to argue with the government of the day, it's to cozy up to them. That's mm. the kind of rule. drives me nuts. And there isn't any place we can go and say, look, this is a really bad idea. And if you want to go with go to war with China over Taiwan, how would you justify that? So people talk about uh, the freedom of the Taiwanese. Well, the Taiwanese have freedom. They could have it as long as they want. Chinese don't want to invade them. That's stupid. But they will if they have to. And so, you know, we, we have ways out of this, but you, you have to rely on uh, history's legacy. That is, you look at other people who face the same choices. You look at the future a little bit. Look at the role of technology and where are we in all of this? I mean, I'm hanging out for the day when nuclear weapons become anachronisms. When that day comes, like the cross and like like the, the crossbow, it'll be sitting there, useless. People wonder, what am I doing with this thing? And the same thing with these solutions. We have to have solutions that actually solve problems, not yesterday's problems, the problem before that. And when I hear little Australia, 25 million people buying F-35s, nuclear submarines, I'm thinking, has have somebody lost their mind in Canberra? I mean, why isn't anybody questioning these purchases? Look, they may, I, I've seen F-35s at air shows. They are terrific. You know, you know they're, 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 they're terrific. A great theater. But to spend all this money on a futuristic uh, uh, risk for which there is no basis, it's almost criminal behavior. It is, uh, at the very least, it's uh, a profligate waste of sources. You know, I think I pointed out to you on other occasions. If I didn't, I'm going to labor you one more time. The, the second highest expenditure between the Manhattan Project and the end of the Cold War in 1991, the nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons platforms, and nuclear weapons research. We spent, the only thing we spent more uh, than on nuclear weapons was Social Security. I mean, it was the second expenditure after the safety net. And, and, and did it. And of course, you know, lots of good people say didn't really save us from World War III. I think it did. You know, people like Gareth Evans, nice guy, says all that money was spent for nothing. It was just sheer luck that we get out of the Cold War. That's not true. Those weapons, the enemy looking at our weapons, so it's going to be a bad idea. So uh, does a nation like Australia actually have the resources to spend that kind of money on? future weaponry about a threat that doesn't exist. I mean, we're talking about uh, very odd behavior. And, you know, people in high places can get you killed. There was a great line by H.L. Mencken in 1915 about politicians uh, and, he, and businessmen. And I'm going to take that back. It's, it's Walter Whitman. Mencken had something else to say. Lincoln said in 1915 that Americans will one day have a guy in the White House who is as moronic as they are. And that was that was the Trump quote from 1915. But he, uh, uh, Lippmann is this great journalist one day. He's going to be a great journalist. He's at Harvard working in the Crimson. And, and he says that uh, politicians and businessmen don't mean badly. Most of the time, they don't mean anything at all. And, and so when we allow these people to make these, these major commitments while at the same time they're starving universities. I'm thinking, there's something wrong with this picture. Now, in the early 1970s, when Australian universities were filled with the, the great intellectuals, they would have fought, and they would have fought hard. But now, nobody fights these people. I mean, they don't offer an alternative vision of the world. So we're, it's kind of a 
Well, Australians are sleepwalking, so to speak. You know, they, they you can pretend this isn't going to happen, but that water will rise. There's no doubt about it. Poverty will rise. Nuclear weapons will proliferate. It's only going to get worse, and we got to figure out how a country of this size, which doesn't belong here, it was an accident, because uh, the Brits couldn't dump off their troublesome Irishmen in the New World anymore. They had to dump them off here. So Australia is an accident, a wonderful accident, a great place. But we, we have to figure out how it survives. So I say once again that our history is not carved in stone. And then if our young people don't solve this, it doesn't get solved. And, uh, you know, there was a, a great line. Henry Kissinger was having an argument with the Turkish foreign minister. This Turkish foreign minister didn't want to do something for Kissinger, some kind of quarrel. And Kissinger says to the Turkish foreign minister, and I quoted him somewhere. Kissinger says to him, I want you to know something. I don't go to bed worried about how you're going to defend yourself in the future. That's your problem. It's not my nightmare. And so, you know, as these people who lead us, what keeps you up at night? This idea of going to war with Taiwan over a non-issue should keep people awake at night. I mean, I, I, I do Moscow, Beijing, Istanbul, American, European media telling this message. Now, people probably think I'm eccentric and overly focused on this. But if I see a generation of Australian young people go to war for the stupidity of their their leadership, it's unforgivable. You know, it's just unforgivable. In 1939, when Menzies gets on the wireless and says, uh, Britain's at war, therefore we're at war, good evening. That's one thing. And when President, uh, when Prime Minister Menzies decides, or he says in a letter or in his testimony to the Johnson Library, in the decision to go, the decision to, go to war in Vietnam, I made up my mind in five minutes. So when, when these people make up these decisions without public discussion, you know, and when we bought these submarines, uh, was there any public discussion in parliament or among people or anybody? This guy just says, we're going to buy 60 to $100 billion worth of submarines from the Americans and the British. Thank you very much. You should be grateful. What? You've just committed the future of Australia to a defense that is meaningless. And, and, and so, you know, major decisions are made in this country without proper input, without discussion. And that's the role of the universities and the think tanks. To say the think tanks don't think very hard because they're trying to cozy up to the government. And the universities, you know, it's filled with people who don't care anymore people who want to be left alone and, and some people who don't want to be left alone, who don't have any traction is the senior people aren't going to say anything. They don't want to say yeah. anything. Yeah. They can't say anything. And so we, 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 have, uh, uh, we have literally defaulted on leadership. Now, look, I'm not going to say Australian University in 1973, when I got here, were perfect. But there were people who ran them had something to say and people listened to them you know they weren't above the people they spoke to the people and, and today we we don't have any of that you know these great topics that you raised with me should be weekly discussions somewhere with other people but you know even on uh, australia's q a and the abc you, you don't hear the great issues you're not discuss you get partisans they got partisan people and and I, I look at this and I'm thinking, maybe I'm not seeing this correctly, that we have the people who think, and you don't need a damn university degree to think, you know, people without a university education are, are not unintelligible. People know when they're being, being conned. And when you don't have these discussions and major decisions are made on behalf of everybody, because, you know, father knows best, whatever it is. I don't know what's going on. I mean, I don't understand it. 
And then one day when the people get angry, when they march down uh, uh, to the Westgate Bridge, say they don't want to be locked down anymore. Forget about all the arguments. When, when people get, show up at, at Congress and they're angry, and then everybody's surprised. You know, people, people reckon that when people get angry, it's an insurrection or it's a riot or it's a trade unionist revolt or something. These are just people who are angry because there's no one speaking for them at the top. And, and as President Eisenhower said, when people are angry, get out of the way because they'll start marching in your direction. So we got to solve these problems and, and instead of, you know, listening to default reasons why we do things. But look, if we could avert war with China, that would be the perfect segue to solving COVID, biodiversity, nuclear proliferation, and poverty. We're not going to solve the big issues until we get this one off the table. As well as and while Australians are fixated on this, as well, you know, I don't know Tony. I'm sure he's a well guy. But people tell me he's not. I don't know. I don't never met him. You know, to have a former prime minister go to Taiwan and say that to cause the lady who runs the place to say that the, the world's lining up with us now. What, what, what is that? I mean, th that is craziness. You know, he doesn't represent the Australian people. I'm sure he represents himself. The way I represented myself when I encouraged Europeans to help the, the Ukrainian foreign minister. Yeah. But you can't do that when you're facing this kind of conflict. And look, the the Chinese have an obligation to restrain themselves. And they will as long as the Taiwanese do not declare independence. Fair enough. So if I said to you, you can have everything you want, you can do it the way you want forever. But just don't declare your independence to give um, aid and comfort to dissidents on the mainland. It'd be a great deal. And, and so I'm not selling them out. I mean, you know, in my lifetime, we've already walked away from the South Vietnamese, the Taiwanese in 79, and the Iranians and everybody else. We've walked away from these things many times. The United States has no trouble uh, making course corrections. It always comes right. And places like Australia, England, and France find themselves uh, out of step because they're so in step that when the U.S. changes direction, other countries don't really know what to do. Well, if other countries have a lot of bright people working for them, they don't have to be young. They can be new. I don't care what age they are, as long as they, they think strategically, as long as there's a plan B. And my, my, I suspect, whether it's China or COVID or anything else, we don't have a plan B. You know, mm. There is no plan B. This is why um, in the 1960s, when Americans found out that uh, people in Washington in power had luxury caves to go to, to wait out the nuclear fallout, and there was nothing for them. They got very angry. What is this? You know, you've seen the movies where only certain people get to go in and everybody else is out. It's not how it works, you know? We're all in this together. And uh, I'd like to see some enlightened leadership. And I also like to see a bright young Australians, you know, enter politics for some reason, they go into mm. law or medicine, private sector, whatever it is. So Australia doesn't attract, I don't think government attracts its best people, a lot of good people, and they're talented, but they don't think strategically. They don't know anything about history. Mm. And as the great uh, Santiana said when he was working at Harvard, if you don't know any history, then you can never defeat it. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the World Garden Podcast. For more episodes just like these, or to join our community, go to thewalledgarden.com. See you there.